dinner. All right. Good evening. I now call to order the regular board meeting of the Park Ridge Park District Board of Commissioners. Today is Thursday, October 3rd, 2019 at 7.03 p.m. Um, may we Please rise to say the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Marianne, may you call the roll, please? Sure. Commissioner Coyne? Commissioner Grau? Here. Commissioner LaDuke? Here. Commissioner Leach? Here. Commissioner O'Donnell? Here. Commissioner Tunnels? Here. Commissioner Hamilton? Here. All right. Does anyone have anything they'd like to amend, add, delete to our current agenda this evening? We just want to save room for the budget. All right. Seeing none, we'll move on to any um, public comment on non agenda items. I see a few guests joining us tonight. Looks like they're all here to listen and perhaps engage on the budget. All right. So now um, we'll get right into the meat of tonight. I will turn it over to, um, actually, you know what? D Executive Director Mountcastle, could you give a brief overview of the budget process mm -hmm. for the board right, real quick, just as a refresher, because I know we have some new board members and going through it. I don't know if we've quickly done that yet to kind of, I know Sandra mm -hmm. gave us an update, but and what we're, how we're doing this in sure. steps and why we do it that way. Yes, so there's um, several parts of the budget and we break it up into the different items that the Parks Department has done that we put them on benefit and um, funding. Yes, and so this tonight will be um, presented to the board for the discussion of those different aspects. And then the next um, meeting will be all the bond so that'll be in March. So that is then all the administration and then um, that the big chunk of the budget. And then the last time in November, we asked the board to come back with what you know you, you see as a senior recommendation or some of the things that would be recommendations to improve you know the budget and in terms of the money and the staffing that we don't have enough money to make sure that um, in general, yeah, I guess I would just add, so we did publish the proposed budget document. Um, I sent a copy to all the board members. It is published on uh, the website, on the public information page. Um, and what we found is um, it's a lot of data. Um, and in order to kind of present it in a more digestible fashion, is how we've put together these presentations and broken it up so that it's not so much all at once, so you have time to kind of think through it, ask your questions. We'll be happy to respond. And then, um, as Gail mentioned, uh, we're looking for direction from the board um, on that November 7th meeting because our objective is to have the budget adopted by the board prior to the beginning of the fiscal year. And by law, it has to be um, on public display for 30 days, uh, which is um, the actual budget and appropriation resolution. So in order to get that ready, we are looking for the board's direction on any changes to what we've proposed by that November 7th meeting. Um, because if we waited till the next November meeting, we wouldn't have 30 days before the last board meeting in order to approve the budget. Um, so we have, um, we would also be doing the truth and taxation resolution at that meeting um, as it relates to the levy. Um, so we would, you know, the board doesn't actually adopt the tax levy until the last meeting in December is how we've got it on the calendar. But the, um, the impact of that on the budget, um, we would like direction prior to then um, so that we can move forward. Uh, 
helps. And then the tax levy recommendation is presented at the next meeting, correct? Yes. Yes, along with the operating. So you'll get all the data. So it's they're more of listening and asking questions as you see them with things coming up. And if there's any big outstanding thing you're objecting to, we'd like to hear that. And then what we're doing as a staff is taking your comments as best as we can of requests from these meetings, people have questions, and trying to get it out to all of you. So if somebody asks a question of something, we're getting, for example, there was um, a question on um, HR by Commissioner O'Donnell. So um, we're trying to get that all together and then get it out to all of you before the next meeting. Um, we certainly also would be happy, you know, we have a lot of new commissioners and, you know, part of this is, you know, helping you to understand and be comfortable with this. So if you want to set separate meetings, you know, with the staff um, in the different departments or myself or, you know, Sandra, um, during this process, we encourage that. Thanks. Mm -hmm. That quick refresher overview. Uh, before we dive into yep. the um, good idea. 2020 capital project proposal. Um, Commissioner LaDuke, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, um, and I'm going to turn it over to <laughs> Terry Wolf, who, um, <laughs> who, uh, well, uh, I put the numbers together. Um, I will, I will mention that I have left as a handout for you um, a list. It has a blue heading. Um, these are the all of the projects that ha are incorporated in the proposed budget. And Terry is going to uh, walk you through in detail um, why these projects have been identified. Thank you. Good evening. Um, so as Sandra mentioned, uh, you'll get to hear the proposed 2020 capital uh, budget presented to you uh, by me tonight. Um, although you'll be listening to me speaking, I have to acknowledge that this is, of course, a team effort. Um, I especially want to thank Gail, Sandra, April, and all of April's team, as well as uh, Jennifer Meunier and Christy and everyone on her team that have all worked so hard, um, especially at the, the last few hours running up to this to get everything in order for the presentation. So um, I really appreciate everyone's help. <clears throat> so the capital budget process. Um, I know we just talked a little bit in general about the capital um, budget and in, in, or the the budget in general, but for the capital budget, um, our approach, our process is to first look at um, replace, replacing and repairing our existing assets. Um, we also look to hear from our commissioners on what your priorities are. Um, we look to the 2013 master plan to see how or if these items that we're uh, looking at are addressing some of those needs. Um, <clears throat> and then we finally look to new initiatives that are either based on community or staff input. As you may recall, back in June, uh, June 20th meeting, uh, we did have a discussion uh, with the board where we worked to identify some of the priorities that the commissioners sought uh, going forward as we looked at our capital process or capital budgeting. Um, while there were a lot of different ideas, some of the recurring themes that we um, saw in that were, were the ones here before you, which are the nature center ponds, uh, trails, sidewalks, pathways, tennis court surfaces and their conditions, picnic shelters, land acquisition, and North Park planning. As we go throughout this presentation, what you'll notice is that I've used uh, three different font colors uh, for some of the different items that we talked through in the bullet points. The most pre uh, prevalent is going to be black. Um, black is going to identify that this is the replacement or upkeep of some of our existing infrastructure. If it's highlighted or if it's in blue, then it's a new amenity or something that we don't currently have in our mix of amenities. And then if it's in green, it's something that meets with in some way, shape, or form some of those uh, priorities that the commissioners have identified. So this will just help you see how some of these things are slotted in here. As I mentioned, the vast majority of these things will be in black because that's the primary goal of our, um, of our capital budget plan for 2020. So with that, and as I continue through, um, feel free to stop me for uh, discussion or ask any questions along the way. I think as we're going through the slides, that's a great time to do it. Um, I did include a lot of pictures this year to help with understanding and seeing what some of these things are um, because they might not be things that you see every day. So. 
So the first thing that we're looking to uh, complete next year uh, at Centennial Park is a park um, complex signage. Um, what this would be is uh, adding in a sign for um, the main part of the park. This would be out at the corner, um, and it would be similar to what we see at Main Park, um, not a marquee sign, for example. Um, in addition, uh, we would in include some building uh, signs at the different buildings there to help people understand where the buildings are for wayfinding. The parking lot over at the um, Centennial um, Park um, has many islands throughout the park, uh, through the parking lot. Uh, those islands were installed as part of the um, pool renovation project that happened in 2013. Uh, that project, uh, we installed uh, landscaping in those beds, although some of the plants were not as salt tolerant. It was kind of a, a, a last minute change approved by the architect, landscape architect, um, was a variegated um, form of uh, liriopi, which just wouldn't hold up to the salt as well. So in some areas it held up and, and survived, in some areas it did not. In some areas even the non-variegated liriopi did not survive, and so it just wasn't a really good selection of plant for there. Um, staff is proposing to replace that, um, and just so that it's clear what we're talking about, it's these islands here in the parking lot. Um, it's not the landscaping that we did last year up along the building, but this is something that was done with the pool project. Question? Yes. So when you talk about that island, you're talking just about the pool, you're not trying to incorporate any dirt or mulch or anything. Correct, yes. What we were looking to do is, as you can see here, um, there's already existing trees. We'll be, you know, those trees are in good condition. Um, and then when you look at this photo, this is an example of where, um, you know, some of the plant material is, is survived over here. Some of it's overgrown with grass over here, and we've got, unfortunately, weeds growing in here. It's just become very unsightly and hard to maintain. Part of the issue is that we've got so much open space here that there's just ample space and uh, fertile soils for the weeds to take, care, to, to take over. So what we're looking to do is fill this in with a ground cover that can help cover this area um, and assist us in not having weeds get established there. Um, one of the other challenges with this is when we constructed this in any other parking lot, the city does require that we have islands in the parking lot. They do require that we put trees in those and they require that we put in ground cover. Um, obviously they don't have something that's following up and telling us to date that we have to maintain the ground cover because they haven't made that comment, but with the bare soils, it leads to mulch. And when we have a lot of these heavy rains, um, sometimes that mulch washes off and starts to block our, um, our culverts and sewers in the parking lot. So it's kind of a, a, a bit of an ongoing challenge for us. It hasn't been any major issues or concerns, but it's, it's, uh, it's a little unsightly. Uh, it's something we would like to improve upon, and um, it helps us long-term with our maintenance needs as well. Here's an example of one that's just completely bare. Do you think that this investment will then help us not have to revisit this as a board in six years and with some additional, it sounds like there's maintenance issues too. Yeah, well, some of the maintenance issues, I mean, there'll be some time involved in, in maintaining the new plants, uh, but we do feel that once they're established and they fill the area in, um, it's a lot easier to maintain a full landscaped area than it is a vacant, empty piece of, you know, dirt like that. So. Um, we would look to select plants that are more salt tolerant, something that can handle the conditions that are out there. Um, as you may or may not know, the city does the salting for our parking lots and they prefer to get through it once and not have to come back. And so they're very generous with their salting applications. So um, that, that certainly doesn't help for the plants out there, but that would be our goal. So. Uh, in addition, uh, we would like to landscape the northwest corner um, of the building. Um, as you recall, last year we did landscape the um, northeast corner as well as the eastern edge of the building and up along the south and near the front and the main entranceway. Um, that project was done for a number of reasons, done with a contractor. It was a larger scope project. A big portion of the, of the project included the egress stairway from the, uh, the track. When we did the planning and designing, we designed several different areas of, uh, of the facility for the landscaping plan. So we have a landscape plan available to us for the northwest corner. 
we're proposing in this situation that we would have staff um, implement that plan on this corner, and it's why we can do it so affordably. Just for an example, this is what that corner looks like right now. Uh, this is that northwest corner. As you can see, it's, it's uh, overgrown. It's got a number of um, trees that are um, dying or dead here. We've had to remove a few already. Um, and then there's just some leftover bushes and shrubs. And it's uh, another area where, again, it's, it's a challenge for us to maintain. And it really doesn't have um, kind of a direction of, of what it should be done. Um, the other corner, as you know, we did last year and was very successful. And we think really helps dress up that front side of the building. It's easy for staff to identify what's a weed, not a weed, and how they can go in there and manage and maintain that. <clears throat> well, yes. So, in terms of ownership of the house, if does the staff have the right to actually view it as the kind of community feature that you want to have the same thing as like the common square that has to be done to the front of the house? Um, you know, we have um, from time to time, and we actually had um, uh, an offer for a small donation from uh, Lurvie's. Um, a few years ago on a project that unfortunately didn't didn't take off, but um, we still keep up with that relationship and we'll be happy to reach out to them again. Um, we didn't have not discussed that as it relates to either one of these projects, but um, I'm sure staff would be happy to reach out and have those discussions. So. Sure, absolutely. That's a good idea. how much has been spent over the past three years at Centennial for landscaping? Um, last year, the project for the landscaping at Centennial was just over $200,000. Um, the stair egress was the vast majority of that. And while I don't know that I have the breakout or available, my guess would be that that accounted for about one hundred and twenty dollars to $140,000 of that project overall. Mm-hmm. Uh, moving over to the Outdoor Centennial Aquatic Center, um, we're looking at the, um, the locker room and, um, you know, over the past few years we've heard a lot and we've known since we did the renovation um, that the locker room um, was something that could use some, some dressing up. Um, this project would be to make some improvements there, not a full-scale top-to-bottom renovation. Um, the goals for this project would be to um, improve the floors um, by refinishing the floors and to replace all of the um, partitions within the, the space for um, the restrooms and the changing areas, et cetera. Sorry. Um, Joe? Yes. Partitions, I do, and I clicked it because it should have been in here, and apparently I forgot to insert them. So I would be happy to share them another time. But um, so the floors are, it's a, it's a concrete floor that's been painted and sanded. Um, it's got um, the, the gray colored paint. It really kind of pulls the dirt from people, and, and as they're walking across the parking lot, it, it shows the, you know, the asphalt that gets kind of walked in off of people's shoes. Um, what we're proposing to do is grind all that down to a natural concrete state and do something similar to what was done at the splash pad, which would give it a nice texture and make it something that we could more easily manage and maintain. I think it would have a little bit more of a natural look, um, and I think it would be fitting for the space and a lot easier for us to maintain long term. And we could stop the process of painting, which is also a, a time-consuming and costly maintenance item. Um, the partitions are currently metal. And there's areas that they're rusted and jagged at the bottom because they've been there since, I don't even know who could tell me how long they've been there. Maybe Gary. <laughs> we identified Gary as our town historian when it comes to the park district earlier today at a meeting. So, um, uh, so you know, we would be replacing that with, um, <clears throat> with partitions that are uh, plastic. And the hardware for it would be aluminum and stainless steel so they wouldn't rust. So... Um, the, the third component that we're, we're trying to, to accomplish would be uh, to improve the showers and the shower configuration. Um, one of the things we've heard a lot in our surveys as of recent was 
just that we're having difficulties with the shower. Some of the mechanisms don't work well. We actually had a leak that was behind a wall earlier this year in the spring that we had to, you know, pop a few bricks out and go chasing down through the walls, which was challenging, um, but also an issue with the temperature. And so um, we've been working towards and working with some plumbers to try to get some pricing. And while we don't have all of those numbers firmed up just yet, one of the goals that we're trying to accomplish with this is also to improve the shower conditions there. And that's something that we've heard, as I said, on not only from uh, surveys, but we've seen with secret shoppers and um, there's been comments for, for quite some time. But uh, when we did the pool renovation project, we just we didn't have the capacity to do the undertaking of the entire um, locker room as well. So, yes. You know, the floor and partitions would be, I mean, the, the floor is a concrete floor. I could say that that floor would easily last 30, 40 years plus. I mean, that it really has somewhat of an infinite lifespan. Um, the plastic partitions, same thing. I mean, easily 30 years. There's, there's nothing to corrode on them or go wrong. So, um, barring any vandalism or things like that, but... Um, in addition, uh, we are in need of replacing the water heaters um, for those showers at the um, Centennial uh, Outdoor Pool. Um, these heaters are large commercial heaters. Um, they're actually housed in a mechanical area within um, the activity center. Um, and as you can see on the picture to your right, um, those are the burners and they've completely disintegrated. And so um, these have about a 25 year useful life. Um, these were installed in 1984, so they're at 35 plus years or will be at 35 plus years um, next year. So um, so we would be replacing these ideally before the season next year. The last item um, for the aquatic center is uh, to regrade the turf. <clears throat> One of the things that we heard a lot about when we were designing this um, this project was to include um, areas where we had turf and people could use and sunbathe, similar to what they were experiencing at um, a Glenview pool uh, at the time. And so we went through a lot of effort to do that. Um, and one of the things that was required by um, the Illinois Department of Public Health was, Health was that we had a, um, a slight drop off on the edge of the concrete so that it wasn't completely, the grass wasn't completely flush with the concrete. Um, their theory at that time was that, well, then you wouldn't have dirt, et cetera, running off onto the, um, to the decks. And so, you know, we went through a lot of work and, and, and accomplished this, but, you know, with a lot of projects like this over time, the dirt and ground settles a little bit, especially with the irrigation and the heavy traffic because it's been such a popular amenity. So as you can see with these pictures, we've had quite a bit of settling and you can see almost the full exposure of the side of the concrete. Um, we have, you know, seven or eight inches in these areas. There's other areas where it's at about two or three, but, um, you know, clearly this is something that we don't think is a good idea and leads to possibilities for people to step right off the edge and roll an ankle. So um, we would like to begin to address this next year and, and um, you know, cover up so we don't have exposed sprinkler heads, et cetera. Um, so this is also something that this project would take place in the fall, um, right at the close of the pool where we have ideal growing temperatures for um, grass and give us an optimal amount of time to get two growing seasons in before we have people back out on the turf again. So, oh, <clears throat> Moving on to the activity center. Um, one, at the activity center, there is a uh, storage room uh, there's an outdoor access to that storage room. It's a steel door. It may look familiar if you're entering the, um, the Centennial Aquatic Center. Um, the center's entrance would be just to the right of this. Um, so as you're entering, this is what you're faced with. Um, not only is it unsightly, but it's, it's degrading quite a bit. There's uh, um, holes completely worn through right here. Um, so this is something that we feel like is important that we replace both from a security standpoint um, as well as a aesthetic standpoint. <clears throat> uh, the copy machine over at the um, activity center is, is due to be replaced. 
Um, it is uh, seven years old, which is uh, at or past its life expectancy. Um, it has having um, calls for service quite often, I'm told, from, um, from Jenny Myers, the facility manager. The lobby um, has a carpet that was installed uh, several years ago. Um, it was actually it's, uh, seven years old now. Um, carpeting should be replaced in a commercial facility about every six to nine years. Um, as you can see uh, in this picture, staff has already done some replacements. You can see some of the newer tiles here, and you can see all the staining here. Um, we would continue with um, you know, some upkeep with this, but we've run out of new tiles and they no longer make this um, style. So um, we feel like it's at a good point and the price point's not terribly expensive uh, to just replace this and then we can have some attic stock with, uh, with something that matches the facility a little bit better. Um, it really sticks out too because as you continue on down this hallway, while you see we have the luxury vinyl floor just in the background, Beyond that is the hallway that goes down past the library, and that was all uh, newly carpeted this year, and so it really kind of drew to that. This was um, showing its age for sure. <clears throat> In the main room, um, the uh, multi-purpose room, uh, it has two movable um, divider walls. Um, this is not the greatest picture, but. Um, I did slide this out a little bit to show that it is deteriorating. Um, these, these were installed um, when the addition was built back in 1989. Um, <clears throat> not only has it become aesthetically unpleasing because it's delaminating and peeling apart, but these partitions are very heavy. Um, in fact, it takes uh, two staff to move them off. And so um, when, you know, it, it's just the rec staff over there, that it takes two of them to get these things moved out, and that becomes uh, very problematic for them. Um, newer ones would slide very easily, just like the ones we have at O'Connor. Um, we know it's an easy process for, for two people to, or for one person to move um, and would look a lot better to them. <clears throat> Finally, at the activity center, we're proposing to add sinks in rooms three and four. Um, these are at the far south end of the building. Um, these sinks are, are would be in areas that serve um, both our adult um, art classes, which were moved there from Main Park at the time of the Main Park renovation, um, as well as the Brick and Art Studio, and would also be available for future birthday parties and kind of a key element when you have a, a, a kid's birthday party. Um, it's been something that's been uh, listed as a, as a demand and, a, and um, something of a concern for um, the adult art classes since they moved from Main Park because they did have um, sinks in there. Um, a current process is that we have to open and unlock the janitor's closet nearby to allow them to use uh, that sink so that they can have their art classes. So, yes, Brickton as well. I did. <clears throat> Moving on to the fitness center. Um, annually, we do replace our fitness equipment to keep up with the trends and to keep our equipment. Um, you know, in good shape and, and functional for our members. Um, next year, uh, they will be doing um, their usual equipment replacement, um, 49,000. Uh, it's anticipated that this will cover two treadmills and the remainder of spin bikes that are not purchased uh, this year in, in 2019. Uh, they are anticipating a complete or a total of 18 spin bikes. Um, and then if there's any money left over, they would plan to purchase an elliptical machine as well. requesting to replace the uh, gym divider curtain next year. Um, the gym divider curtain is original. It's uh, over 25 years old. It's showing major signs of deterioration. As you can see, the, the fabric itself is tearing. Um, and on the back side of this, um, <clears throat> this tear, um, you can see here where there's some cabling and stuff tying this together. So um, this is really getting pieced together and and while it's, it's functional right now, it's been inspected for safety. Um, this is just one spot of many along that wall. Um, it was something that <clears throat> upon closer inspection when I uh, made it recently, you could, you could tell that it was time to be replacing this.
Um, as you're aware, we, we offer our members of the, of the fitness center um, towels, and with towels comes washing machines and dryers. And um, <clears throat> the uh, washing machines were purchased, or this washing machine that we're looking to replace was purchased in uh, 2006, and it does have a useful life of about 14 years, so we're right at that point. Um, in addition, we're looking to replace a dryer. Um, this dryer has a little bit s s uh, smaller useful life of 10 years, uh, and this particular dryer was purchased in 2005. In addition, we're looking to continue with the priority renovations on, on the indoor pool. As you may recall, this year well, we had made some plans to deal with uh, the air and water quality uh, within the indoor pool. Um, the, the goal this year was to not only work, do some work on the, um, the filters, um, but to do some changes with the HVAC system, which would help remove the chloramines uh, from the space. Um, the bids came in high. We didn't accept the bids. It gave us an opportunity to kind of go back and revisit because our engineers and architects on this project had kind of a few um, last minute changes and ideas as we went into that bid. Through the process of evaluating what our different options were, we had some further discussion and researched the idea of using it. UV light for treating the water. We think this is a better approach for the next step and the first step in this process because it treats it really at the source of the problem and lowers the occurrence of chloramines versus evacuating the existence of chloramine. So it's kind of going more at the root of the problem and we think it has the potential for eliminating some of the future costs related to this down the road and bypassing some of these other HVAC um, changes that could be. So. Um, while we were unfortunate that we didn't move forward with the project, we're also kind of glad because it gave us a chance to really take a harder look at a few of these things. And so um, we are proposing to move forward with it in that manner. Thank you, Gary. Yes. You mentioned the first step approach. And that, what do you mean? Yeah, what type of project is that? Is it, is what? this a full type of project or is it something bigger? I'm sorry. <laughs> Yeah, so last year um, during the capital uh, budgeting process, we had just completed an indoor pool um, conditions analysis. And with that analysis, we had identified a three to four phase um, step process that we stretched out over the course of, I think, 10 years that we would be implementing different things to help keep up with our existing amenity, which was the pool. One of the things that we'd identified was that um, it just the chloramines were an issue and that wasn't really addressed well um, with the initial design. In addition to that, some of the, um, the requirements with the pools have changed where the level of chloramines that are allowed have been lowered since that facility was built. So um, what we're trying to do is address not only that, but the shell of the building um, and ultimately looking at, you know, replacement of some decking, deck tiles, um, a lot of different upgrades with the, with the holistic of the natatorium and the pool. Sure. I think you have a list of here. How much is it? Two hundred eighty thousand. Two hundred eighty thousand. So, what do you mean? Like a year ago report. Yes. How many? You add up all the phases. So what are we looking at? I think all the phases, all said and done, were over a million dollars. I think a million five, okay. if I recall. I just like to. I think the public, their character too, is to know that we're not just talking two hundred eighty thousand. Sure. And and to be to be totally clear, which I don't think that I mentioned this, I would be, I'm requesting 280 thousand additional dollars to the remainder of what we have this year. So I had a budget al allotment for this year that we will not be using all of it. I'm asking for using the remainder there plus 280,000 more to complete the rest of the work. Because we did some work on, um, on filters and electrical things, et cetera, this year. Um, but this would be in addition to what was left over. Terry, Terry can I just add, yep. um, we haven't gotten to my part yet when I start talking about projections, but um, in the capital asset replacement plan, there is detail um, that you can look to to see when these expenses are planned for going forward. Mm -hmm. I don't know if we'll ever have a room to lift right. in that same feel, but 
Sure. So that might be on your report too that you know take us through in five years when we install no. <laughs> But this sounds like if we go forward with here, we're looking at another one point two million at least. Yeah, it's I I total uh, from our last um, capital meeting, it's one point three. That and that goes out. We've got a large one, five hundred twenty-eight thousand in two thousand twenty-four. So that's mm -hmm. when that ends. So a little shorter, and, and it depends. You said ten years, but it depends when we do all this, right? Right, because there's a whole litany of projects that we got in this report when we did the analysis, and you know there's different phases that can shift a little bit depending on when we, we do one, then the next one comes. And yeah, and we did some of that. And I, I one of the other things that we talked about with staff was. You know, we still have some money to do some, um, you know, in the budget in future years to do some work with the HVAC system. Now, we know just as a facility at some point in time, there's going to be some level of work required on it. To what degree and what level and what's the, you know, the outcome and the need there is yet to be determined. So the idea is that this had the highest likelihood of starting off with this and giving us the best chance to reduce those future budget needs without completely eliminating those future budget needs and being totally ignorant to the idea that we would have other things to spend on. I think the other thing just to, to point out is that, you know, for, for this project, and one of the reasons we, we you know, got into doing the, um, the indoor pool analysis last year was we wanted to take a look at, well, what's this amenity going to take to continue to upkeep long term? And so we took a look at that. I think... Um, we can continue the pool without UV, but it's it's a challenge for us to operate it, um, and I don't think that that's in the best interest of the district long term. So um, it's just it's problematic. They don't even design indoor pools without it anymore. It gives us a level of you know security and sanitation and everything else. So um, I, I really think it's important to do if we're going to continue to have an indoor pool was to continue down the path of these improvements. So. Yes. Okay, and then the um, first thing that I heard from the member um, for Collier County was something like um, some financial uh, update plan in phase one. Do we, how do we track this survey results in phase two? You know, I, I, the number one public comment that we get um, from my perspective at the indoor pool has got to do with the water temperature. Um, the water temperature is directly related to this in such that because of the chloramine levels are so high and we don't have any better way to manage it, we're forced to dump water to bring in fresh water and get rid of the chloramines. When we do that, the heaters for that building aren't sized properly in the middle of winter to keep up with that. And so we have a very particular and precise program where staff comes in and works an overnight shift and one of the pools gets exactly 13 minutes and the other pool gets exactly 20 minutes of water loss because we know that by the time they finish that, we can gain back about 0.5 degrees before the pool starts the next day, which is usually about two degrees lower than they like it to be. So we know the pool extremely well at this point, more so than we really even need to, I think, generally. But um, this will reduce the occurrence and the need for backwashing it really becomes a problem in the winter because the incoming water drops down into the mid to upper 30s, whereas in the summertime, we track the incoming tap water and it's in the 60s. So just that fluctuation and that difference is enough to make a huge difference in everyone's water temperature. So. as well as um, uh, chlorine chemicals and stuff in the pool what is anticipated, yes. Yep. Yes. Couple questions. Um, so you could look at this one way and say we're a year behind. You know, we, we had some recommendations, we rolled out a plan, we say can't pull our pockets right now. So sure. We don't have too much time. And I thought that okay, we're not going to, we don't want to end up like we ended up at Oakton and have to lose our pool. Right. Um, are we behind or, you know, where are we here? I would have preferred to be going into the winter, this winter, with having completed one of these projects that would help us with 
keeping up with the temperature of the water. Um, so from that perspective, we're behind because I feel like we're not going to be providing the best possible customer service this year because of that. At this point in the year, I can't change that. I think from a perspective of the pool and the overall degradation of it, this project being pushed a year doesn't cause that pool to have a, a less of a useful life or anything like that. So um, the, the most unfortunate part is that we, we will not have better pool water temperatures this winter. So. Another question, Wally. Have you had, so I, I know you, you commissioned a study. Mm -hmm. Have you had conversations? Have you traded experiences with the other people, with the indoor pools in the town, the high schools? What they've done, what kinds of problems they've had, what kind of projects they've done to maintain their pools? Um, I don't know that we have with the people in town. Have you, Christy, had any conversations? I, I've, I've spoken to other people in other park districts about their indoor pools, um, just from the perspective of what did they, what changes did they make, if any, to improve um, their quality. And, and I found that uh, some have done the UV transition and it made a, a drastic effect for them. But I have not shared or discussed with the, the school districts in town. Should that not be considered? Sure. You have to have some of the same challenges. Well, they might be. They might be. So process. It would be good to know yeah. what they've done or what they neglected to do, or there might be some lessons learned with that experience. Sure. They don't want to lose that pool. No. Anything else? All right. <clears throat> Continuing on with the fitness center. Um, in addition, uh, one of the items we want to do is to add and replace sound barriers. So, um, in the indoor pool. Um, there are a number of sound barriers up at the ceiling. This helps with reducing the noise and the echo. Um, as you can see from this picture, um, these sound barriers are falling and, um, you know, the cords that hold them up are falling. They're actually disintegrating. There's holes and stuff there. Um, so they're, they're past their time. We actually had them on our list to replace a couple of years ago, and they've been pushed off to align with the projects that we're doing in the pool. So... Um, we do anticipate doing this next year. Um, in addition, we're looking to add um, something similar, maybe not exactly like that, but some sort of a noise baffling system in the lobby to reduce the noise and also in the spin room to help reduce the noise. So those are areas that it can get very loud. There's a lot of hard surfaces. Um, and I know even from personal experience with trying to work and be on the phone in that lobby, you, you can't even, I can't even make a phone call in the lobby. It's just too noisy. So um, we're looking to improve that. <clears throat> um, the fitness center does not have an alarm. Um, and mostly because it has people in it 24 hours a day. Um, but we do feel like it's important because we've seen some shifts in where uh, the cleaning services are not there. 100% of the time at night, and so there can be some gaps from time to time where we don't have uh, staff or people in the buildings or, um, you know, holidays, et cetera. So um, with that, and one of the drivers of this was the addition of a panic button um, that we would have uh, at the front desk. Um, all of our facilities have a panic button at the front desk, and we think it's important. Um, and we just want to bring this up to snuff with all the rest of our front desks. So. Um, we're looking to replace the ceiling tiles on the second floor. This would be the area uh, over the fitness equipment upstairs. Um, as you can see, um, it's they're old. Um, they're, uh, they're, they're over 10 years old, which exceeds their life expectancy. Um, I'm not exactly sure when they were put in, but um, they have some staining. Um, they're very dark and dingy, and they really kind of absorb the light upstairs, and we'd like to uh, put some new ones in there. They're really... Some of the edges and corners are brittle and broken off. It's just it's kind of unsightly. It looks like we're not keeping up with the space. So um, we think it's important that we replace this and try to brighten that area up a little bit. All right, computer systems. Bear with me on this one. Um, we're looking to replace the Microsoft Office, the Microsoft Office 2019. Um, we do currently have Office 2 2013, which is expected to no longer be supported by Microsoft um, in late 2021. Um, we do plan on implementing this over two years. 
Um, 55 licenses are budgeted for next year, and the, the rest would be budgeted for the following year. Yes. Is that, is that a one-time license, or is this one of these where it's... It's a perpetual license, um, so it's not an annual operating cost. Um, we're looking to replace a server. Um, this server is currently housed at Main Park. Um, IT's goal is to move their server over here to Prospect Park, and then Main Park would only be used as a backup. Um, in addition, they would convert this uh, to a virtual machine, and it houses all sorts of files and network um, drive for the district. Uh, we also need to replace our backup um, UPS. Uh, UPS is the uninterruptible power supply. Um, it notifies that the servers that there's a power loss and allows it to shut down safely. Um, currently, what we have is outdated and it's not rated for commercial strength. Um, the Proxim wireless antennas. Um, these wireless antennas are over at um, Hinkley Park and they help us help support our wireless camera systems that we have over there. Um, the current antennas are outdated. They don't support the bandwidth needed for optical camera uh, performance and, and storage, which we found to be very important for us. And then finally, we need to uh, replace network component switches. Um, these, uh, were, these are three of 12 network switches. They have a useful life of about four years. Um, and this is something that are planned for an ongoing and repeated um, upgrades um, so that these are updated before they're becoming obsolete to help our network system. Are those new to this meeting? The network switches? Mm -hmm. I'm not 100% certain about mm, that, Amanda. No. No, there because we have all these facilities and we're all connected. We have a number of network network switches throughout the district, so these are the oldest of them. And um, you know, part of our capital asset replacement plan work, um, Terry's done a great job of you know kind of identifying um, systems. Uh, what needs you know? How can we improve the replacement schedule? So we're doing the same thing in IT and. Um, this is one of those things. So that's the point about that now we're, we've incorporated that into the projections going forward, that these need to be replaced every four years or so. What is it that makes sense to do in this case? You said uh, optical camera and you just explained that this is all optical and there's no network switches. Yes. Park, <coughs> we we're requesting uh, money for doing a master plan design development. Um, some of the items that this would cover is are, are listed here: the athletic field light replacement, um, the inclusion of a new picnic shelter, uh, the addition of community gardens. We'd have pathways throughout the park for accessibility. We're looking to replace um, the irrigation out there and also include some sort of field drainage as well as some batting tunnel improvements uh, where we would provide power and per perhaps a, a better um, surface at the batting cage tunnels. Part of this project came about because of the need, well, we have the athletic field lights, they're, they're in need of replacement. And you know we've had these other, other needs and concerns that we've heard from uh, baseball and football, as well as commissioners and all sorts of other users. Um, we're aware that we have you know drainage issues and the irrigation system out there is, uh, is nearing or at its useful life. Um, this project in total, uh, we would anticipate applying for the OSLAD grant in the 2021 cycle to help offset the cost. Um, the current estimated cost for this project is um, Um, as part of this project, I should identify that both the lighting uh, and the pathways would be TIF eligible. Okay. 
Mm -hmm. um, so every year in our capital budget, um, as, and I believe we started doing this last year, but um, we include a revenue line that uses up our available um, ADA funding, although we don't necessarily identify which specific project it will go to. We have an understanding that we have needs and that we'll be offsetting those needs with those available dollars. So, um, I Currently, we're allocating 100, like in the projections, 197000 of revenue from the ADA fund annually. Timing on this, the odds like when we apply for that. Yeah. Yeah, I think. I think that's a great plan, but I feel like I'm going to be a grandmother before we get committed. Well, hmm. <laughs> one of the one of the other I things that I think. Close to being a grandmother. <laughs> <laughs> one of the other. Uh, no, nothing. <laughs> um, one of the things that that, that Gail just alluded to was um, that with this plan, it's more than just the uh, design, like a concept. Um, we prov we requested enough money to take this all the way through construction documentation so so that we could be shovel ready when an Oslite project comes along. This also gives us, to Gail's point, plenty of time to have community engagement meetings, et cetera, talk to the affiliates about how these different amenities would affect their uses and everything else. You never should have told us community garden on that, on that tour. You never should have. Because you tell us, and now it's another year away. Well, I mean, we're we're continuing to plan and look for a space that it can work. So. And the, the benefit of bringing people in with extra hours is one that you have that time to think about it. Yeah. Like I said, I I understand yeah. totally, and I agree that. I'm and the balance of the TIF funding is approximately $600,000. Um, the way the agreement works, um, the projections show about 350000 in 2021 should we get all of the project expenses ready to submit. And then the balance of 250000 at the end is, is when the next draw would be available under the agreement. Mm -hmm. Could. We could. It could be in there. It might be. It could be more if we have more ADA expenses over sure. a couple of years, right? Just kind of pulling the carpet around mm -hmm. where, where our project funds would be. Sure. So it really is on that issue of the health of the project. Yep. Just don't stop. Yep. Just figure out what we can do next year, what are we trying to do at Woodland and what's right. not. So there's a lot of projects. Considering all these funding options, we're looking to throw out a really good number. So what would that number net out to, assuming that all those funding options came to us? And then over what period of time would this happen? All those funding options? Yeah, I mean, just hearing the math real quickly, it sounds about like zero.
that over what time frame would we be able to do all that? Uh, next year? 2021. What do you think? I, w I would assume. I mean, it, the goal for us would be that we have everything designed, developed, ready to go, shovel ready by the time we're going uh, to apply for the OzLad grant. We hear back from the OzLad grant in theory around this time next year. I'd be standing before you with our next year's capital budget presentation requesting the money to do the project in 2021. You guys have graciously said, yes, great idea. And then we will be out to bid with it right after the first of the year so that we're getting great bids in, we're ready to go. Project starts in the spring, potentially. One of the caveats there and one of the big things that we need time and energy to talk through next year is with baseball and football affiliates on hey, what does this mean to those fields out there? Are they going to be usable or not? So, But in theory, that would be the way we would try to approach it. If they felt like we needed to have another year to plan, then we would need a little bit more. John J. <laughs> <laughs> We know they're in need. Uh, we're budgeted five hundred thousand dollars for it. Yeah, and and you know they could be something that we could consider to look at, but we don't currently have that money requested for next year in our funding. So, oh, we'd figure something out, but mm. we already have been. <laughs> We're trying to get a little bit farther in front of that than we are right now. But. All right. Vehicles and equipment. Um, last year we had pushed off uh, the replacement of one of our vehicles to this year. Um, this year, again, we as we were going through the process, we started off with um, having four vehicles identified. Um, we have reduced that to uh, three vehicles. Um, we are still requesting uh, to replace a F-350 um, dump. Um, the vehicle that it's replacing is a 2003. Um, it has uh, about 41,000 uh, miles on it. It's uh, It's got a lot of rust on the bed. The, the um, tailgate's not working well. And it's just in, it's in poor shape. Um, this vehicle is used for um, landscaping, transporting dirt, you know, whether for, um, you know, the landscape crew, ball field crew, um, whatever. We also use it for mulch and various other um, projects. Um, we're looking to replace two of our Ford Rangers. We have four total in, in our fleet. Um, Obviously, they're smaller vehicles. They weren't even making them for a few years, and so we were kind of hanging on to some of these because they serve some of our needs well, and they're a more cost-effective um, truck for some of the staff to get around in, um, especially during the summer months. Um, <clears throat> just to familiarize yourself with the, you know, the type of vehicle that is. Um, the all of these um, vehicles were purchased in uh, either 2007 or earlier with the Ford Rangers. Um, where each one of them is around 41,000, 42,000 miles on them. Um, <clears throat> one of them in particular, truck number 15, was in a front end collision this year. Um, and we're a little surprised Paderma didn't decide to total the vehicle, but um, we paid our $1,000 deductible, had it repaired and it's just not been quite the same and it developed kind of a, a vibration. Um, so that one's definitely one that's gonna go. Uh, and then staff will continue to evaluate the other 
um, three vehicles to see which ones make the most sense. But um, they're very useful for us in our day to day. And so we want to replace them before they become too worn out and, and um, abused. Both of those um, situations, you know, we've identified and worked through a, a replacement plan for our vehicles and have targeted a 10 year time frame. These are all situations where these are obviously in excess of that 10 year time frame. Um, and we, even though we had four in our plan for this year, we continue to evaluate and to look for ways that we can, you know, make these last a little bit longer. And what can we, what can we do with, you know, pushing this off a little bit more. Uh, in addition, we're looking to replace our uh, Toro broom. Um, this is a broom that um, gets a lot of heavy use, primarily in the winter, clearing off sidewalks. Um, see it around all of our parks. This is what we use instead of snow blowers. It really reduces our need to put down salt. As you can see, it's in pretty bad shape. The front end's very beat up. Um, right now, um, the door is kind of, it's got a, it's a homemade door. They had to put together some plexiglass on it to make it work. And um, we're having a lot of parts and pieces, gearboxes and chains breaking on us. Um, parts for this are quite expensive and they have a long lead time. It's, they're unpredictable. It's not like things that we can just keep a bunch on the shelf because it's kind of cost prohibitive to do. Um, but when this piece of equipment's down, it has a big impact on how we can manage our snow operations in the winter. So, um, so this is one that we're looking to replace. And it is, um, remind me, Christy, it's seven years old, that piece of equipment. It's that piece of equipment is about seven years old, which seven to eight, I would say, is appropriate age range for something like that. Uh, the next piece of equipment is a production mower. Um, similarly, um, this production mower is very needed heavily, but in the opposite season where this is for cutting grass, um, this cuts about a 16 foot wide swath. As you can see, there's two panels here that fold down when it's out in the field um, for cutting our grass. This is what we use to cut all our uh, main fields. Um, this has a lot of um, hours on it. It's uh, it's a 2013, um, so it'll be seven years next year. Um, it has constant issues for us, and parts take an abnormally long time to get for this piece of equipment as well. Um, becomes a real problem for us in the middle of our growing seasons. We're heavy with all of our baseball and football and soccer. Uh, we need to get the large fields cut because those aren't done by our contractors. Those are done by us. And we've got one of our largest pieces of equipment down. So we're looking to replace this so we can continue to keep up with our um, fields. We also have a utility vehicle and range picker for uh, the driving range. Um, this piece of equipment actually was budgeted to be replaced this year. Um, but we're just requesting really to roll the money over for next year. We for went foregone the, the uh, replacement, um, but um, there's a lot of gaps in, in the in the frame of this vehicle. And you can see there's some areas there where um, golf balls are able to get in there while the staffs are operating it. So um, this was purchased in 2012 and has a seven to 10 year life. So it's in the right age range. Um, and the picker was with was purchased with it at the time has similar um, useful life. Twenty thousand five hundred. Yep. Uh oh, what happened there? I don't know what happened. Oh, there we go. Let's see. I got my screen. There we go. Okay. Yeah. Um, those ones that we described there that we talked about, yeah, the ones that we're looking to replace, each of them happen to have about 41,000. Um, I guess for those in that situation, yeah. It, it varies from vehicle to vehicle and how they get used, but yeah. Um, one of the challenges we have is that um, when we get into the summer months and we have a lot of staff here, we need a bunch of vehicles and then we have other months of the year in the winter where we'll have some kind of parked off and we, you know, storm away for the winter. So, um, you know, these particular ones might not be reflective of the ones that get a lot of miles. The ones that have our plows on them tend to pick up a lot of miles because they're getting used a lot in the summer and in the winter. So 
that could attribute to why some of these lasted a couple extra years to what we normally would see. So, um, last item here on the equipment list is a um, turf sprayer um, for twelve thousand um, dollars. This turf sprayer is used to apply uh, pesticides. Um, its current configuration and motor just are not designed for um, use with all of our equipment. In fact, the way it's set up, it has to be pulled behind um, one of those small pickup trucks, which is really not ideal. Um, it doesn't have a boom sprayer, and while we don't really do much for boom spraying anymore, there are times where it makes sense for us to put um, some products out in a boom. Um, this doesn't allow for us to do that. Um, the cost to reconfigure this existing uh, setup, it just doesn't make sense when we could uh, purchase a new one and, and with, the, with the age of what this is. So. It depends. I mean, we do do some spraying from time to time, so. Very little. There you go. Very little, <laughs> but, but still spraying, so. <clears throat> um, the last item, while it's not a vehicle or equipment, it applies to that, um, is a propane filling station. Um, Assistant Superintendent Solberg has done a great job at implementing um, the use of propane for a lot of our new equipment. So we've been using propane for all of our mowers primarily. Um, I know she does envision trying to get a propane vehicle or two in the future. Um, propane is not only better for the environment, but it's also more um, cost effective as means for um, fueling up our equipment. So um, something that we've been doing successfully, it's allowed for us to see a, a, a small savings in our fuel and oil accounts and our operating budgets, and we consistently get um, rebates back when we're purchasing this new equipment as well. So it's kind of got a, a lot of added benefits to it. Well, we, the way it works now is that um, a truck comes out and fills up our tanks and, you know, gets us loaded up and we have a cage where everything's at. This would allow us to have a bigger station where we could fill our own tanks and we wouldn't have to be visited as often. So do you have anything else you wanted to talk about with that? Not that I'm aware of. Do you know? I don't think they do. Mm. Yeah, primarily we're use ours for our like our smaller equipment at this time. We don't have any vehicles, and I don't know if they have quite as much as we do, or if that would have made sense for them. But yeah, if you could find out and let me know, that'd be great. All right. Uh, the Hinkley Pool has some uh, roof repairs that are needed. Um, this picture is a little bit hard to see, but um, on the inside, we have some areas here where there's some water dripping. Um, if you look at this picture, it's got a puddle on the floor. So um, we were a little bit surprised to see this when we were gathering some pictures. So we're actually might be removing this from the budget because we might be addressing it sooner than we thought. So, uh, But nonetheless, this is something that we put some, some money in to do some repairs on that uh, roof over at the Hinkley Pool. Uh, J.C. Park. Um, this is the first time we're going to talk about tennis and basketball courts. Um, as we know, um, you know, we had some discussion, and earlier this year we had to um, close the um, Woodland Park courts because of their condition. Um, we're going to be refurbishing those, and with that project, that'll be a full-depth removal similar to what we did at Hinkley. Um, but that process is, is, a, is an expensive process, and we have a lot of tennis courts and, and basketball courts. And so um, when we looked at our um, capital budget for a request for 2020, um, we really wanted to look at what do we have out there, what's in the future, what other areas do we have to maintain, and how can we do this without breaking the bank? And so we needed to find a, an affordable way to stretch our dollars and still provide the amenities to people. So um, having done some research and... Um, looking at, at, at different options, we've decided to go with a grind and overlay. Um, this is a crack that's currently out there. Um, we decided to go with a grind and overlay at JC Park. It's a smaller two-court tennis court system. Um, there's also a basketball court next to it that's included in this. Um, the idea is that we would remove the fence. The fence around the tennis courts is about 10 feet tall. It's also very beat up and in poor condition. We'd remove the fence allowing the equipment to come in, do the grinding, overlay the asphalt, put in new nets, reinstall the fence, paint everything out, and open it up for operation. 
Um, as you saw, the cost for this is just under $100,000, which includes the cost of the fence, includes engineering, includes the painting of the courts and everything. Um, if we were to do this um, court in a full depth replacement like we did at Hinkley, I would anticipate that it would cost upwards of $288,000 or more. Um, this project, we believe, should give us a useful life of about 8 to 15 years, which is typical for grind and overlay projects, but um, we haven't done them extensively in these areas, and so that's a little bit remains to be seen, but we feel like this is a great location to try it out and see how it goes because it's in such poor shape, it has such a need, um, and because it's only two tennis courts, so it has a smaller footprint. Um, if we do not move forward with this project, I will likely find myself in a position that I have to close these courts to the public next year. Sure. Yeah, I, I don't think we'll see it to that degree. And we did not do a grind and overlay at Woodland. What we were doing was using a product that um, is commercially available in five gallon buckets and we're spreading in to fill in the, the cracks. It's actually similar to what you see. That's probably why that's discolored green. So, um, so I, I, I don't anticipate to be the, the, the situation. Um, one of the other um, things that we're planning on looking into with this project is the idea of doing some sort of um, low cost drainage option around the perimeter of this. One of the things we've learned in that um, we is that the lack of drainage under and around these tennis courts has a huge impact on how volatile they are in the winter. Um, we knew that going into Hinkley, we designed it to, to mitigate that. Um, we have that same plan as we go to Woodland. As I was doing a lot of work this year and research on what has happened in our sport courts over the course of time, one of the interesting things that I found was some old blueprints for South Park tennis courts, which are probably the ones that are in the best shape at this point, yet they're the oldest. They're also the only other ones that have drainage around them. So that, that tells me that that definitely is a successful way to manage that, and it's very important to get the water away from these. So one of the things that we're looking at doing while not spending the money to go full depth is we're gonna try to do a little bit of a swale on the one side and then circle the with a trench and some drainage pipe that goes into that swale. But we won't be connecting that swale to the storm sewer. We'll be filling it with some native plants and hoping to see it drain down. Where it's gonna be kind of a, well, let's see how this works. For a low budget, can it help us? does it add some life expectancy? So it's just something else that we're looking at as we look at this project, so. Um, yeah, I think we can do it within there. I think we'll do a combination of, you know, get a few quotes from some contractors, see where we're at with the pricing on everything, maybe manage some of it in-house if needed, so, or volunteers even, because this is kind of a maintenance project. So the Main Park Leisure Center um, has several different playgrounds. Um, one of the playgrounds that we associate really with the Leisure Center and the programming needs um, is the, the two-year-old's playground. Um, and I, I can read that wrong still. Um, <laughs> sorry, I got corrected by Margaret when we did our practice run, and I, and I didn't fix the punctuation, so <laughs> I'm terribly embarrassed now. Um, so anyway, the, the two-year-old's playground that's on the um, west side of the building is something that really serves our programming needs. It's encompassed via fence. Um, this was installed a few years ago, and as you see, we put in um, you know, this rubber tile surfacing. This is a commercial playground. Uh, it's, it's made meant to be used in a park setting. Some of these other amenities that are around it are not meant to be in a park setting, um, but because of the needs that we have with the kids out there, we do have a few items out there. Um, this upgrade would include a couple of additional play panels, et cetera, to give the kids something else to do, a little more interest, and we could then remove some of those non-commercial items from um, the play space. This was a project that 
was originally um, planned and budgeted for last year, but we had pulled it out uh, looking for opportunities to save money. Um, we're also looking to um, add in some drapes and blinds. I struggled with the color of the font on this one because while we're not, they don't exist now, so I'm calling it new, but in a lot of these locations, they existed prior to the renovation. Um, just with the change in configuration of the rooms, there were times that um, some of the windows that are in the, um, the park in the ridge room that were on different sides of walls had different blinds. They had gaps in them because of the, so they didn't work. And some of the offices, when the walls got rebuilt and um, gypsum board was put on them, that we lost a half an inch on each side and our, our blinds no longer worked. So um, staff and, and the rooms have been going without now for the past several years and it's proven to be an issue in some areas. So we have kind of a two phase where we're gonna put in some next year and then the following year we're anticipating to put in some more um, to put in some drapes and blinds. So, and this is throughout the whole new wing and the office renovation area. Yes. I need to ask, but why do we need drapes and blinds in an office? Is it better that way? Well, it can be sometimes, depending on where your office is facing, and maybe if there's a need for privacy. Some of those office windows are right at grade level. If you're having a discussion with a patron in your office and they could be easily seen by people coming up the front walk maybe, maybe it's just on like the label because i i'm just very curious mm -hmm. i know you can put description next to your name and stuff like that but i just wanted to okay Um, at Main Park, um, we have two uh, boilers. Uh, each of the boilers are original um, to the building. Um, this last year, uh, we refurbished one of those boilers. We had um, to re remediate uh, asbestos insulation around them as well as around the pipes, and we retubed the boiler. Um, we're looking to do boiler two next year. The way it works is that the, the building generally functions on one boiler, but you always have a backup. Um, we were in a position last year where we were running on one boiler that was kind of on its last leg and praying that nothing happened and that we had. And there was days and times where we were without boilers as they were getting fixed, but there was enough ambient heat to get us through the few hours. So, um, so we had money budgeted this year and we had completed one of those boiler refurbishments and we're looking to complete the process with a second one next year. Um, we do expect that the refurbishment of these boilers will, should last us 20 to 25 years. Um, while they're not new, uh, these are older and they're not the highest efficiency, they're still fairly efficient, around 80% efficient. Um, but one of the things that we looked at when we considering this was um, we got some um, price estimates for putting in new boilers to cover this building. And new boilers system for this building would cost us about $470,000. When you consider that and consider, well, maybe that has a big impact on saving our, our gas costs, et cetera, um, we only use $17,000 in gas for that building every year. So when I looked at the overall dollars of, you know, refurbishing these existing boilers without having to shut everything down, replace with new boilers for the savings of not a tremendous amount of money, it just seemed like this was a better route when thinking about all the other budgetary constraints we have. So the main park ponds um, have been something that we've all talked about a lot. Um, we're asking for money um, to continue with the pond sediment removal. Uh, we are nearly complete. We thought we were going to get completed with the West Pond um, this year, but they, they were just a little bit short of what they could finish. But it is almost completely done. Um, as you can see, the picture on your left is the East Pond, and the picture on the right is the um, West Pond. Um, the picture of the West Pond was just taken about a week or so ago. Um, one of the things that you'll also notice in the background is um, the new aerators and um, how it's rippling the water. Um, the previous bubblers did not have the same effect and weren't meant for the right depth. Plus, with all the sediment, they weren't functioning uh, the way they really should. 
But now that we've removed this sediment and we're incorporating these new aerators as we're going along and doing that, they're designed for this depth of water. They're more effective in rippling the water and disturbing the occurrence of um, the algae growth. So um, we will be going on our fourth year with this and it's been a long process, but we're definitely seeing improvements in how it's making a good impact on this. Um, Christy recently had uh, an expert out, I can't remember from what company. Yes, someone out from Integrated Lake Management um, who came out and, and was looking at the pond and, and had remarked that um, we are in fact doing exactly what he recommends and said that the pond, the West Pond, was in really good shape considering this time of year. So um, we're, we're feeling pretty good that this is something that makes sense. Um, you know, as a reminder, this is something that we don't think will be as aggressive in future years, but we're dealing with decades of of nobody doing any kind of management on these ponds at all. And so we're, we're just kind of catching up um, deferred maintenance, if you will, on getting all this sediment out. Um, we're looking to continue on with finishing up the West Pond, moving on to the East Pond, and hoping that will look just as nice in future years. So the poor sediment bag has been contained but not fixed. Um, we are in uh, discussion with our insurance company, Paderma, and um, trying to determine how, who, where, what, and when is going to be paying for any cleanup that needs to happen. And um, we're also in the midst of trying to schedule the um, pathway renovation in the very near future. So um, we're trying our best to expedite everything there to line everything up and make it successful this fall. So um, it's been contained, but it's not cleaned up yet. So, yes. Question on the aerators. So um, those aerators Functioning as they're intended, they're not intended to keep the water off above the surface. They're Correct. Functionally effective that way. Yes. Is there anything to add to that? You can fully drain the surface of the water and continue with the renovation. And that's the third issue we have to deal with with this one is the water getting stuck in the Um, one of the other things we're um, looking to um, add next year at Main Park is a garbage enclosure. Um, Main Park's always been a busy facility. Um, up until just a few years ago, all the garbage for that facility was picked up by our staff every single day, put on a truck, and driven across town. A few years ago, we added in garbage bins, and so it gets stored over there. And it's stored behind the boiler room and wasn't really a big deal. You could see it maybe from some of the finance offices in the past and, you know, it was manageable. No one really complained about it. But once those became programming rooms and everyone looks at it and I can tell by the nods on everyone's heads that you know exactly what I'm talking about. So I'll keep talking and we'll just say that we need to have garbage enclosures. <laughs> anyway, we, we need a much better way to manage that and deal with it. So we're looking to enclose the garbage area and we'll put it out by the parking lot. Chocolate chip oatmeal with caramel cream. <laughs> Jennifer knows how to make that. Well, I'm going to take a break. <laughs> and get a little more. Oh, no, no. Oh, grab a cookie. Grab a cookie. Oh. January is over. <laughs> okay. All right. Playground replacement and design. Um, so the main park playground is arguably probably one of our largest playgrounds, if not our most heavily used playground. Um, it serves hundreds of kids every day, especially during the summer, during camps or even the preschool programs um, and all the, the kids in the neighborhood. This playground um, is definitely one of our oldest playgrounds and in need of replacement. Um, we want to begin the planning process next year with the idea that in the subsequent year, we might be applying for, possibly applying for an OSLAD grant, not in 2021, but perhaps in 2022. But the idea is that we want to start this planning process. Um, throughout this planning process, um, we want to um, look at the idea of, you know, evaluating whether or not there's room to expand this um, and even consider whether or not an expansion of the playground and or nature space makes sense into the open field out there where there's currently baseball and, and soccer. Um, I did break this news to Gary and Ted this morning at a meeting um, and they just 
told me that they would need to have that field replaced, at least replaced somewhere else, but um, certainly open to discussions. Um, didn't yell at me and scream at me until I left the room. Um, the geese. Um, we do anticipate that because of the size and scope of this playground that it would be a, approximately a $1 million uh, playground renovation. So it is a quite sizable playground, which is why there's a sizable design budget. Um, the idea with this is not only the, uh, considering OSLAD funding, but other funding and grants available through playground manufacturers with I'm somewhat familiar with, um, or even depending on how we went with this, it could have other funding sources as well. So that would be something that with such a, a, a long lead time for the planning and designing on this would allow us to look at the different funding sources and really hone in on that as a, an important aspect of this project. Yes. Uh, I believe that was in, installed in 1991. Yeah, at Northeast is is Northeast is more of yeah Centennial for sure. Yeah, Centennial was about 350 thousand, obviously a, a couple of years back. But um, I think just because of a, the square footage. B, I think there's been some interest in talk about having some sort of a, a nature theme. Um, and I think that it's important that we have an appropriately sized. I don't even, I think the, the playground at Centennial makes sense for Centennial, but it's very vertical. I think a playground appropriate for the users of Main Park, it would probably be a little more horizontal with some vertical aspects to it. Once you start going horizontal, you're increasing costs on surfacing and other things. So. I just think, you know, with that and the site amenities, that playground also at Centennial didn't include the cost of the site amenities, as I recall, for the shelter, which would have been an additional cost. So, um, so I, I just think the holistic approach at this would probably be more. In I want to see back at Gilead at this point. I think it's just beginning to get there. Right? Yes. <laughs> Sure. And it makes sense to incorporate more natural aspects there. Mm -hmm. like I actually do want a baseball park to stay, even though add some shrubs to that green wall at times. Um, in the case of this, um, we're just talking playground here. I mean, we're not, we're not talking some crazy gardens here. So it would be playgrounds, all the amenities installed, surfacing. So we we got to bring you out to Bison's Bluff. I mean, yeah. this would be like a Bison's Bluff light. So it's a you know nature play area that's much more expansive. So you have streams, you have you know natural setting, you have and that, and that's probably my fear. That's yeah. my fear because you know we're talking a hundred thousand dollar design and we haven't even talked about the concept. So let's talk about the concept and talk about what it could look like, and then talk about the hundred thousand dollars in budget. I prefer. That's my feedback. You know, but to get hundred thousand dollars deep into something conceptually, I guess scaffolding. Mm -hmm. For another million dollar price tag, when I'm adding them up pretty fast here, it just seems like sure. A little, little uh, like we don't have the money. Yeah, well, and we do have the the money allocated for that playground, and I I, I summarize and generalize that it's a million. I think we have nine hundred and fifty thousand budgeted, and it's either I think it's twenty twenty two. Um, so we do have that built into the current budget uh, projections. So it's uh, not. Baiting you with a hundred thousand dollars with something we don't have. Sure. So um, I, I think you know the way that I might suggest that we approach this is that if we have some money available to design and, and we we understand that there's an interest of of the board as a whole to have a little more discussion about what path we want to take with this before we get into spending this money before we engage um, you know an, an architect to help us with design and, and selection of this equipment and how we're going to approach it. I'm I'm open for that completely. I got all that. That's exactly what I expect at the meeting. Sure. So I expect to have a concept out of the meetings, talk through, understood, not behind the scenes, and then hundred thousand dollars, then a million dollars, even if it's out later in our financial budget, because that is the appropriate public discussion. And we're talking that kind of money. Sure. I will not be able to get 
to a concept budget for us to sit around and talk about without spending some of that hundred thousand dollars though we can talk about some features though I sure think i think and i think anything else we're talking about here right that and that's what i think uh, what i'm suggesting that we how we approach this but even just for I, like I hear a little more discussions needed. Laid out eight or nine things for Hazel, mm -hmm. right? High level, board meetings, socialize with kids. I don't have an idea right here what we're talking about. That's all I'm asking. I think um, I'm understanding what you're saying. I think what Terry's saying is I think we can have the conversations of there's different ways we can go with this playground, right? We can go traditional playground, and it can be as big as the footprint that is there. We can go with one of these nature playgrounds, which – or more expensive from what I'm hearing for these features, right? right? So that right there, or we could go with, you know, a different concept out there. So I think we can get to that with the board yeah. and show some examples yeah. of like, this is what a nature type playground looks like. This is what, you know, the size we're looking at. So some general like, okay, go that route, right? Go, go this direction. We're all in favor of this type of playground, right? Or this type of a concept and maybe we're gonna use some of that land, right? And this is what we could do out there. But what I would suggest is, if the board is okay with it, is that you let us, you know, if this is a project you wanna move forward on, we keep the dollars in there, but we, you say this in your voting on the budget, we don't spend those dollars until you're comfortable that you're at that place as a whole, right? That we're at the place of the type of playground we're looking at. Yeah. Does that make sense? It's just like going North Park. Right, if I'm mm -hmm. doing that right, we the staff gave us some initial thoughts mm -hmm. as to what North Park could be used. Then we talked about it, we deliberated mm -hmm. on it, then we made a decision. Yes, I would just like to get at least at a conceptual level before we start allocating large amount, amount, amounts of money to sure. larger projects. Mm -hmm. I just think that's what I'd love to spend my time at these meetings with, not necessarily relative to the budget. But just sure, up with some things like that. Yeah, no, that's fine. I, I mean, we could absolutely do that. I think, I think you're hitting the point. Yeah, I think that that's what we're saying. And then um, it was 93, did you, that that playground? It's 1993. Oh, 93. Yeah, so, yeah I didn't that's have okay. that sheet in front of me, but I that's okay. early 90s. It, uh, that amount didn't run in the budget, just so you know, so it's kind of a surprise to us right now. Um, but I, ap I apologize. Terry was a little ahead of me in um, revising the list. It has been showing up... Um, in our capital asset replacement plan under miscellaneous because we've sort of allocated different playgrounds for different years, not certain which park we're talking about. And I neglected to move it from miscellaneous up to uh, main park. I apologize for that. It is. Mm -hmm. And I would, um, I've said this before, but I think it would be a good start. Like if you do, you know, as we go into the concept, if we consider the, uh, Sure. Yeah, I, I think um, that playground certainly deserves a lot of discussion and time um, from the board before we get too far into it. We know that it's a larger playground and it's going to take a decent amount of money to design, but we just don't know. There's a couple different paths that we can head down with that. And so we, for, by all means, have every intent to have that discussion with the board. So. Playground before we've talked about it on the priority list, and it was already always kind of in the thousand dollar range because it's a certain term you call it as far as what a community park versus some of the other size parks. How does this then, if we were to make this the priority park to work on for next year and the year after that, how, what does that do to our park, our playground replacement schedule around town for our other park? Um, so let me just look at that and just make sure that I'm not misspeaking. So while Terry's looking for that, I just can I point out one other thing? No, I was just checking one other thing um, that we did a similar um, funding plan for Northeast Park, where in 2018 the capital budget included fifty thousand for planning for the Northeast Park, and then the remainder of that was budgeted in the 2019 budget. I just wanted to add that for. It's not a, a new concept. It's it's definitely more, yeah. Yeah, yeah it is. Well, yeah, but it's just yeah. twice as much to write a little bit more on the paper. Right. It's a bigger playground. That's all. 
Um, so we do have um, the way our, our planning has laid out for this is that we do have um, the planning money available and requested for 2020 for Main Park. Then we've requested 50000 in planning dollars for South Park in 2021. We anticipate and are hoping to construct Main Park in 2022. And then we'd be looking at constructing South Park in 2023 while we're then planning for another park that playground that I have on my playground list that's just in the detail of our but really helpful to know just as far as playing playground funding mm -hmm. that we might need yeah four or five years yep is that our largest playground or which one main park yeah I mean I, I, I think main park when I think of our largest playgrounds main park centennial certainly um, you know, Hinkley, those are our, probably our three main. South Park's kind of there just because we use that it's similar to a community park, but it's got a lot of land constraints there as well. So, um, but I would say I, I, I would consider Main Park probably our most heavily used playground for sure. I, it's in the capital plan under one of the tabs, but I can't access it currently because I'm preventing. Where is it? <laughs> and, and, and in the detail of the progress that we're taking from you, it, it is down in the miscellaneous section. You can see in 2023, it's going to cost 500, and this is playground to be determined. Um, 500,000 in 2023, uh, 405,000 in 2024. Um, and I can report uh, Gary's report. So what he's showing is um, he talked about South Park, then uh, North Park, uh, then Hinkley Park, then Rotary Park. So now we're out in 2026. Um, so when we laid out the playground replacement plan uh, with staff, we took a look at not only the age of when the playground was installed, but its current use, how important it is to the, like how heavily it's used, et cetera. So it kind of a, mostly age, a little bit of how heavily is it used and where is it at in the community? Like mm -hmm. as far as is it at a community park, not is it north or south, but like what type of a park is it at? So thank you. Yes. One more question about Main Park. Um, we're trying to raise up money for the outdoor classroom. If we don't get that, um, is that – I, I was under the understanding that there might be some money thrown in to help bridge the gap for the outdoor classrooms. Yeah, we did not put that in here, but that's certainly something within the realm of what we can add. What? I know. <laughs> yeah, Sandra didn't hear that conversation. Well, we're talking. How? Where are we at right now, Margaret? With that about. So we've raised about half, close to half. So that's something we can certainly add if the board wants to take that project on. So when it was taken on, we were hoping um, for a sponsor, and that kind of fell through. So, I mean, it, has it been a year and a half, two years to get to 25000 yeah, so um, uh, there's kids that were passing around. Yeah. Is it because people are missing it? Maybe in the community? Yeah, so, you know, there's kids that have sold things, and then they're like, well, where's our park? Um, yeah, so where's our playground money? I mean, uh, classroom. So I'm just making sure that we're not missing it. 
we can go back and look at that. I, I'm sure we'll be closer to that number by yeah. next year. We have a trivia event on November. Done a great job of showing it. But we love to offer to raise money. Two dollars. Can we just ask if it's going to just give us a sketch of what it would look like? We have it. It's on the We do have a sketch, yeah. How about just a plan? Just bring us a plan. All right. Moving on to Oakton. At the ice rink, um, the main Zamboni is a battery operated Zamboni. Um, <coughs> Zamboni batteries have a life expectancy of about five to six years. Um, the current battery was installed in 2014, so it's due for replacement. Um, we do have a backup Zamboni, but it's a gas Zamboni, so we use that only on limited need um, basis. Uh, the driving range, um, in 2018, uh, we had replaced um, the lights with LED lights. We tried to do that at a uh, minimal cost at a high effect. Um, unfortunately, this was uh, similar to South Park where we just didn't see um, the results that we were looking for. Um, we are proposing to replace this lighting here in the same fashion that we did at South Park. We've heard a lot of comments from the users that um, play at night that you you lose the ball. It gets, gets too dark. It's not putting enough light down the range. So um, so we want to we want to fix that and improve it. Um, then also at the driving range, the uh, the roof on that office garage structure where we get um, where we distribute the balls and, and keep some equipment. Um, that roof is original. Um, it was planned initially for 2019, but we did push off the replacement, so um, we do want to replace that roof. Can you remind me of what the name of the game is for the driving range? Uh, April. Yes. So I went through some of that here too. I would have a hard time in my mind understanding what the ROI on just eight hundred thousand dollars is. It's a lot of money to spend on something that's not used, that doesn't generate a lot of revenue, and who knows where it's going to be once the open master plan gets <laughs> potentially revised. I, I just I don't. That one doesn't sit well with me. I agree, considering how it. often it's used at night. I mean, it's not like the lights are on all day long. I guess we could come back and give you numbers, but um, I would argue that it's a very successful facility just because, I mean, there's, all, there's some facilities that the revenue net is not the whole picture, um, but it is a very valued facility in our community and used um, definitely used at night. I don't know if we can break down the usage numbers in the evening versus... Daytime. Yeah, okay. Different way of numbering how we have to get it done. Um, I don't have customers that can tell me about that. Well, I have a question. Is the, the lighting that you see in the finishing room is not that yellow? It's a different color than the cover glass. Is there anything that would tell us that is there something to the tree that also would indicate? There would be, and we would anticipate. Um, doing that similar to what we did at South Park where I requested the board approve that as surplus property and we'll be putting that out to auction shortly. So I would do the same thing there. So then when it's in the finishing room again, you would see still a little bit of the yellow color. Yeah, we could, we could project and anticipate potential revenue for that, yes. So we can have that discussion, but I, I, I will tell you when I through the budget and looked at all the different areas and uh, you know I don't know it's just it, the numbers that appear on that schedule are really underwhelming in terms of projecting usage and demand for mm -hmm. the community I'm not saying we shouldn't have it but not $25,000 to redo something we just did a couple years ago we can talk about that. I think the, the couple of years ago was a minimal investment and it turned out to be not a good one, right? So that's um, that's one of the issues, I think. And 
you know, we, we maintain that if we're going to have these facilities that we need to keep them up to safety standards and, you know, par with the expectations of our users. Right. It's the expectations of our users. Yeah, but as soon as I can understand, that's why I didn't comment on the, the ball picker up or, you know, <laughs> know right. Two boys is probably get hit with a golf ball. Right. Uh, right. Know, go ahead and take care of that. I don't <laughs> <laughs> understand. I, yeah. Um, <clears throat> also, the uh, shade canopy fabric um, needs to be replaced, um, should be replaced. Um, last year, we did have a large tear in it. Um, we had to, we did sew this. Staff had brought this to a um, boat and marine cover place, I believe, and they repaired it. But um, it, it has a lot of stress and, and tension, and so it, it ripped at that location. So, um, so we're suggesting that we replace this. Uh, for the season. <coughs> um, Wollers Hall, uh, the, the limestone portico, uh, which we all walked through on the way in the front door. Um, if you hadn't noticed, um, there's a number of um, cracks um, that are appearing on the column and on the face of the building right next to the door. Um, you know, because of our this building being uh, labeled as historic, we required to keep the exterior at a certain condition and, and keep it up to date. Um, these also beyond just wanting to repair these so that they meet with the um, standards of the State Historic Preservation Office, we also want to make sure that you know these are structurally safe and sound too. So uh, we have some money in this year's budget where we are um, bringing on an architect to work through some of the planning and design and working with the State Historic Preservation Officer to repair these areas. We're just looking for um, the budget available next year to make these repairs. So, yes. Including this in the mode or the cap? It's the whole thing. That's the whole portico. Yep. Yeah. Um, in addition, at Wollers Hall, we're looking to uh, include a, a generator. Oh, this should have been blue. This is new. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so um, we are looking to include a generator here. As we mentioned earlier, we do have a server room here. Um, and while it's already up and functional, um, we feel that it's really important as we're transitioning everything over here to our primary that we have a backup generator. Um, we did have a situation um, just a few months ago where we lost power to this uh, facility and it, it caused a lot of issues throughout the district where we didn't have our computers, our registration software at the front desks and everything. And so um, we're going to be in included in that would be the rest of this first floor so that we could set up temporary workstations for people to work in this boardroom if we had a, um, a you know, power outage that lasted several hours or days. Um, we could potentially work out of this space a little bit as well. So. It would cover the servers in this, but in the boardroom here. Yep. This room. This room. Yep. IT room. In the IT room. Yep. Um, the hockey building um, copier uh, is over eight years old. It was a transplant from uh, Main Park. Um, when we relocated out of there, they got a new copier. Um, and the HR department got the old one. It's in need of replacement. Moving on to South Park, um, there's a lot of exterior railings, some for um, stairs and walkways uh, along the edges of the building um, that are in need of replacement. They are clearly original uh, to the facility. As you can see, this one and others are rusted completely through. Um, so we want to replace those. Um, the lower level only has a handful of windows. As you know, we're just wrapping up the window replacement and interior um, remodeling of the main floor. Um, we did not have available budget to take, um, you know, the additional um, for the um, for the basement level. But um, they're still very drafty old windows. They're single pane. They're not insulated. Um, we think this would be a good investment. We have a good understanding of the value because we just had it as a bid. So. Uh, we think this is a good value to re to spend the fifteen thousand to replace these windows. Um, and then we're looking to do some parking lot landscaping here, um, similar to some of the things we talked about at 
um, Centennial where it's just, it's unsightly, it's not easy to maintain and take care of. Um, we would like to add in some landscaping in the island and we're talking about is this specifically this area here and up along the street here. Um, this area here is currently grass. This area here is planted with um, some like ornamental grasses and hostas, which really are just not appropriate plants for there. Um, I know um, Christy has talked about the interest of putting in some pollinator um, plants there, own flowers, things like that. So we think that would add a lot of value and interest and might even help with grabbing some storm waters and things like that. Isn't the first part of that grass on the street, isn't that just added? Is it the first part? Or? It's before you, so it's at least four or five years old. I, no, no, it's great, because it used to be there. And it was other things, and I think that previously some staff put some things in there. and Because I would say it's got to be in that three to four range, because it's a triangle shape and everything. Because it's well up. On the first one? No, the first right, right of the casino. Like the football signs and stuff? Yeah, it used yeah. to be just there. Right. It used to be in the middle of the street. Yep. Right. Yeah, I, it had some overgrown stuff yeah, at one point out. that all got cleared out, and then they were you cleared it out, and then you put that in. Yep, there was a, there was a period of time where some staff were going around just plopping okay. plants in just to make sure we had something. So, um, the pool uh, at South Park, um, the admissions building for the pool, uh, as you know, people commonly refer to as the as the shed or the shack. Um, has you know staff and computers. Um, it's, uh, it's this building here. Um, it's it's in very bad shape. Um, as you can see in this other picture here, this is completely rotting out at the bottom. Um, the wood, um, the interior is also has a lot of rotted wood. The wood is wet on the inside, and we had a couple occasions where uh, water was leaking in on the equipment and uh, computers this year. So. Um, we're requesting money so that we can rebuild this structure. Woodland Park. Um, South Park. Yes, we can go back to South Park. Uh, so the whole South Park complex, you know, sure. I mean, as we're stage saying, everything at Oakland, um, there are a lot of maintenance needs there in terms of staffing and ADA accessibility. And over the past two years that I've served on the board, we keep on putting dollars into South Park. Have, are we planning to do a master plan? Do we have that in our foreseeable future? If we've got Oakland going on where we're kind of assessing what's going on there and potential needs, Hinkley master plan, assessing needs. Are you seeing this as like a three to four year out master plan process there? Because in the meantime, we're talking about potential dollars for a playground there. We're talking about redoing an admissions building or some right. things in there. We replaced a boiler last year. We did the floors this year. There's a lot of stuff going on there, mm -hmm. um, but are we really looking at holistically what that complex needs or can do? Um, you know, I, I know at one point we did have some money in the budget to master plan um, South Park, and <coughs> we went through obviously the process with um, Oakton and, and found how that project kind of blossomed a little bit. Um, we do not currently have, to my recollection, money to master plan South Park with the recognition of the fact that the, where we're heading with Oakton right now is going to kind of put us in a situation where we're focused on that and maintaining existing assets for a while. So we've kind of taken that approach of it might be a while before we get to looking at a full-blown master plan there. And that in the meantime, we have needs to keep up with what we have and continue the upkeep of that amenity. Have so, we done a discussion with the architect on the project to see how that's going? Have we done a study just to kind of um, get an idea of what this ailing asset is going to need? I, I, you know, as the park as a whole, um, no. When I think about the facility, that would probably be more of where you'd look at that. We replaced the roof two years ago, that would be a large expense. Um, I have a plan laid out for uh, grind and overlay in the parking lot in a handful of years. Um, I'm just trying to mentally think through some of the larger things. The air conditioning units and generator were replaced within the last three or four years. So with the windows and flooring replacements we're doing this year, I think um, 
a lot of the other things, the building structurally sound. It's it's not laid out well, but it's structurally sound. We're addressing its aesthetics. So I think from that perspective, it has the ability to serve our needs for a while. Um, it is ADA compliant because of that outdoor ramp and because of that elevator. That elevator lift mechanism might need some looking at and replacement in the near future. That's one I don't have um, something on. But I, I think it has the ability to serve um, the needs of the district in the way that it has been serving us for quite a while. Um, and that's just off the top of my head. But we, we have not done a full analysis of that. We've kind of begun that process where um, we've exactly begun that process where we've been trying to gather in all these pieces that we didn't have laid out and we've started to put plans together for parking lot replacements and roof replacements and you know we've been trying to get a really good handle it's just it's an enormous task with a lot to do and we're getting there but we're not quite there yet so we have our facility council yeah they do they do and yet we've been doing so much in the last 10 years so um so no, I, I the quick answer, the long answer is we know that, but I don't. We haven't had it to study. Um, Woodland Park, um, everyone here uh, is pretty familiar with this. Um, as you're aware, we did apply for the Oslad grant. Um, we hope to be hearing in the next uh, couple of weeks or months as to whether or not we've been invited for the second half, and we ex hope to be successful in this. Um, just a refresher of the things that we're planning there is the pickleball courts with uh, shade and seating um, we've got restroom building a picnic shelter some accessible pathways uh, cornhole games as well as a uh, table tennis and this is kind of the middle section of that project which as i said i know you're all familiar with um, yes okay Sounds good. Um, in addition, at Woodland Park, um, we're considering, uh, we're requesting for some money to start planning and designing uh, the irrigation system. Um, the Woodland Park irrigation system is, um, if it's not our oldest, it's one of our oldest irrigation systems that we have. It is at or past its useful, um, useful life. I think the idea here was that we need some time to plan and design this because, again, similarly to if we do something at Hinkley, we're going to need some time to coordinate with this area because it's such a heavy use area. Um, we also want to have some discussions with soccer to understand, is this something that's really needed? Um, you know, there's a time in the middle of the summer where it's not really used that heavily, where it goes dormant because it's warm, but they're not really playing on it then. So um, we kind of want to have a holistic look at it and, and discussion with them to say, you know, is it important for us? Do we need to continue to have irrigation? And if so, let's start planning and talking about it. If not, well, Let's figure out a way to sunset that irrigation or be prepared for whenever it goes and it's done. Um, and also at Woodland, uh, we're looking to do a resurfacing on the parking lot. Uh, we anticipate that we would do this in coordination with the larger project out there, the Oslad project. Even though it's not part of the Oslad grant project, um, we put in some money to do a grind and overlay here. We had looked at this project and talked about this project previously as a potential for uh, permeable pavers or some other system. And, and when we looked at this, um, if we were to do this as a full depth um, you know, replacement, like where we completely excavate everything out, put in new stone, um, just like we did here at Prospect or at uh, Centennial, um, I would be budgeting or requesting a budget of around 240000 or more dollars for that <clears throat> parking lot. Well, um, we did um, ask Smith Group to look at this for permeable pavers with the idea that we could apply for the MWRD grant, which was available, something that the city and the MWRD had been talking about with the library uh, parking lot that's been in the news within the last year. Their estimate to do that small parking lot in permeable pavers was $760,000. The way that that grant works is that they would offset the cost of the difference between the full replacement and the bigger one. So, I mean, there would have been about a $500,000 value from their perspective on that, but it still would have cost us an outlay of, you know, $240,000 to $250,000, which just didn't seem in our plan, especially for that park at this time. So um, with that, and again, with looking at all of these different amenities, our parking lots and everything, and trying to figure out a way to have a good management plan going forward, 
we decided this was another location um, for this park to just do a, a grind and overlay on the parking lot. Would improve the parking lot, give us another good eight to 15 years with regular maintenance, but you know, give us some time to work on that. So. soccer coaching days, I can remember your days of just contributing as much to flooding the fields as the, the weather was because of your days of just moving in and spraying and doing sure. that kind of thing. So I, I know there's varied controls. I'll defer to Christy right now. Can you install the rain sensor for the pristine screen that you did? Mm -hmm. Obviously, the inside is going to need some work, but can you install the rain sensor inside the sensor so the system won't come on? And if there's some sort of That's the problem, right? Right. Which is my other question. I mean, what what's your thinking in terms of what you might do and what kind of time frame you might do it relative to the drainage on these fields? I mean, as you get it done today, will it not even play? But sure. you know, you know, um, we don't necessarily have a time frame on that. It was something that I reached out to the president of uh, Park Ridge um, Soccer and discussed the possibility for um, drainage and that it wasn't something that we were particularly had money budgeted for or were planning on budgeting for, but that we were open for any discussion uh, to advance that project in the future. So um, I, I don't have a particular time frame right now, or just, but we'd be hope, open to talking about it. Said it sounds like a good project or a good idea. We'll get back to you and let you know. <laughs> Do you have any drains that we could ever put that can't play well? I mean, it's just like that. It's sure. A lot. And and I, I I think you know part of our discussion was that you know if there was interest in doing something like that, we could coordinate that during the project that we're doing out there for Oslet if we wanted to, depending on how we approached it, but. So we're open for discussion on that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Good. Um, I, I think when I was the treasurer, those were the biggest water bills. Um, so I thought that was interesting. If you turn it off, I think that'd be great. Um, Cause they don't start playing again until September 1st, right? So you could oh, August, August 1st. 1st. August, right. Um, grind and overlay, remind me what that is. Sure, um, grind and overlay is um, when they they come through with a, a, a machine, they grind the top of the asphalt, um, it takes off the top, kind of gives that grooved surface for a couple of days. They just take off the top inch of it. Typically, there's two different lifts or two different layers of asphalt, both in two inch increments. And so they'll take off about the top inch and then they'll come back and put two inches of fresh asphalt over it. So it has the effect of a brand new surface, but without the cost of excavating everything out and redoing the base and everything. Okay. One of the big savings for us by doing that is when we don't get down into the base, we don't have to add in stormwater detention. So that is one of the values of trying to extend those and be, uh, maybe it's a sustainability measure, I don't know, but you know, we're, we're not dealing with that stormwater issues there on those parking lots because that has a lot of cost for us. We had to do a lot there at Hinkley, correct, so. And, and it's not, you know, larger, parking lots for community parks it's not always an option but i think at some of these locations it, it can be and i i think we want to use that carefully when it's appropriate so and, and does the city's um lack of um giving us credit for permeability did that factor into the decisions at all or not i don't recall jennifer do you remember if that had an impact on i mean we certainly wanted to make sure we had credit but it wouldn't have changed the value of that project at all would it okay right so I mean, it didn't have a cost value on the project. Um, we. Yes. Okay, so it did impact your decision. 
does, yeah. Okay. I brought it up to the sustainability task force, and I, um, I'm going to make sure that they are on that. Yeah. Is that it's an anomaly. Other communities don't have this problem. You, that's correct. And we, um, I mentioned at the last meeting that Jennifer and I had a meeting with some of the city staff, and we made them aware in the planning department of that situation um, because they're heading up that sustainability from the city's perspective on that planning. Um, so we, we made them aware that that was an issue that they were not aware that that's how that works because they don't handle that. That that cost and that is worked through with the city engineering, which is down the other side of the building. So um, so we, we've definitely started a dialogue on that, which we, we agree we think is very important going forward. So I appreciate your efforts as well. All right, I'm nearing the end of my time and we're gonna go into miscellaneous here. Um, so one of the things we have in our miscellaneous um, request here is, uh, is, is money to update our tree inventory. Um, we had a tree inventory um, updated, done back in uh, 2015. Um, we wanna update that document. Um, the goal here is to evaluate our progress since that time, what does our tree canopy look like um, where can we improve it? Um, ultimately, we want to develop a tree management plan um, and then included in that whole process um, and covered in our operating budgets, we're going to continue to plant um, at least 40 trees every year as we go forward. So, And that's something that we've done for the past five years. So we continually add trees. We had a, a couple of years where we lost several trees because of the emerald ash borer. Um, we had a couple of projects that we took on that just because of the nature of the project we were doing, we had some tree loss. And so we are committed to trees and the preservation and making sure that we're managing the tree canopy well. And so we think the tree inventory update is a very important part of that, so. I think several several is a severe understatement, um, several dozen maybe. Um, uh, and, and I told um, Christy earlier that I went to the State of the Tree address at the City Hall on Monday mm -hmm. night. And um, Brandon is uh, interested in reaching out to the school and the park district about the trees and their their plan. Um, so it might be worth a phone call. I told them we're in budget season now. Um, I think they've changed how they procure their trees. They're doing 600 a year, I think, that they're putting in. Sure. So. Yeah, and you know, um, I think as time evolves and we go through the process of updating this inventory and talking through um, like a, a tree preservation plan that we hope to develop with this. Um, you know, one of the things that we have to look at and to be conscious of is that most of the areas that we have in our parks that are open with nothing in it are athletic fields. And so, that. right, we, we already have a lot of, you know, struggles with, you know, some of these trees are encroaching on different uh, sports fields and having to trim them back so that those sports can continue. So we're very conscious of, well, it looks like there's an open space. If we plant this tree in 30 years, it's going to be a problem or, you know, whatever. So, um, but I know, you know, Christy is a huge asset for us in this area, especially, you know, she is a certified arborist. She is definitely a tree lover. And, um, you know, there are, are times where we're looking at projects and thinking about, you know, all right, this tree is, it's in the way. It's not, doesn't look the best, whatever. Christy, what do you think? Well, you know, it's, you're right. It's not great, but it can go a few more years. And so we decided to save some of these trees and have these discussions amongst staff. Um, we did this with a couple of pine trees over at uh, Northeast Park. They have a disease. They're going to die in a few years. There's really nothing we can do for them, but we've left them and, you know, we're conscious of that. So, so we're just looking to continue in, in that effort. So the um, who's doing it? We would likely hire Graph Tree Care, who did our first um, our first inventory. What they'll do is they'll go around to every single tree in the district and mark and map it on our GIS system and take data points on that. They'll measure the the diameter of the tree at breast height, which is like four and a half foot off the ground, and so we'll have an understanding of how big that tree is. They'll grade it on a scale of one to five: good condition, bad condition. 
identify some problems with it. Is there dead wood in the crown? Is there um, roots girdling the, you know, the edge of the, the tree and causing a potential issue down the road? They'll make a recommendation, regular pruning maintenance, remove, high risk, things like that. So then we have a geographic location of every one of our trees um, based on our property boundaries. One of the things that wasn't done um, efficiently and effectively the last time around, because I don't think as much data was available, was exactly where all of our boundaries are. So we have a few areas in our parks where they captured, for example, woodland. They captured every single tree down the, down the edge of the park. Well, that's good, but every one of those trees is owned by the city. It's a city tree. So um, in other areas, like the area behind the driving range um, in batting cages at Oakton, they didn't capture that. So they're going to go back through and capture all of those data points, and we'll be able to cross-reference everything there. So, yep. I assume, too, though, that it's really the prudent step to invest in this and to have a good path forward. Mm -hmm. However, it would have to be a reasonable step to take. And we're considering all of these other things as well before we sign off on budget to have this. There has to be some discussion and coordination we don't operate on an island as the park district. So I would strongly suggest that we have those kind of coordinate understand what the city is doing and what the city needs and wants and see how we can dovetail together to complement each other and make sure that we stay the course. And yeah, the, the city is unique in that they just look at the parkway trees. So I don't know. But you said along woodland we have city trees. So right. there has, there, there's a lot of borders to it. Right. You can't look at the right. park district trees as just an island. And and the schools too. Yeah. Those are the schools. Um, did we apply for that grant, that tree, tree uh, inventory grant? Uh, we did not apply for that grant, but we did talk about that with, um, and we talked about it with Graph Tree Care. Um, they're very familiar, and maybe Jennifer, if you recall, did, isn't Steve Lane one of the people that helps sit on that grant board? He is. Um, he's also a member of the board of directors. He said it just wasn't meant for what we were looking to accomplish on that grant. So we, we did explore the opportunity, but we realistically understand the amount of time it takes to put in these grants. And so we reached out to him to get his opinion, see what he knew about it. And he was had a lot of familiarity and said, no, don't waste your time. So Without the inventory, it's hard for us as board members to evaluate whether Freedom is a good number or not, right? Sure. How many trees a year? What do we need? Where are, you know, where are they? And so from a board perspective, it would help me to gauge, hey, are we doing enough? Are we doing too little? Um, I think that'd be really helpful. Yeah. I have experience in the city of Chicago with Hill Cartwright. Yeah. They never remove the park zone. Mm -hmm. so it's helpful for us to get the freedom zone elements that we're looking for. Yeah. Um, but I definitely would suggest reaching out to the city and getting some more input to see how great we're doing with that. Yeah, happy to do that. So Rob, you can see everything on our computer. You'll pull up every tree. You can see what. Yeah. And we, we do have that. It's just not as up to date, and it's been aged a couple of years. So, we you know, it's one of those things that we need to update every once in a while. So um, so we're asking for some money to renovate, uh, continue the renovation of um, baseball fields and baseball fencing. Um, you know, this is a project that, while we don't have specifically identified which fields we're going to do, uh, we will be discussing and working that out with um, with the baseball affiliate. Um, I know that we've heard some interest from uh, the board here about looking at the fencing specifically over at Hinkley, and so it's something that we've discussed briefly this morning, but we'll continue our discussions as we go forward. Question on that. Is it Hinkley fencing you mean like the permanent or a temporary fence like a stop wall? No, 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 like backstop fencing, like oh, making a safety a bit higher. netting yeah. type approach. Yep. That's what I want to understand. Um, we still have the Emerson uh, field lights on. Um, this is um, still at the request of soccer, a, a, an active uh, opportunity. Um, they're still evaluating what their options are, um, but have asked that we continue to keep this on, on, our, on our radar, and we have. Um, just as a reminder, while we have the expense listed in here, we have an offsetting line for revenue because they have dedicated that they would pay for the full funding of this project if it goes forward. Last but not least, 
Um, we have allocated some money for land acquisition um, related to some of the projects and things that we've had recent discussions about. So if there's no other questions about any of the slides I've gone through. Um, I noticed in the, the write-up in terms of things that were supposed to happen this year and did or didn't um, that the line item about bike parking was not done. And I right. noticed that there were bike parking um, proposals in the yeah. Yeah, I, I think that's something that we, Jennifer and I, um, talked about recently that we need to still accomplish that. Um, and so it's our goal to look at it for this year. I don't know that we have, we do have a line item in our operating budget for um, park amenities where we do um, additions and replacements of things like um, bike parking, drinking fountains, um, picnic tables, et cetera. So um, we're hoping to still get that in this year. But, you know, we do look at that when we do. Um, parks and playgrounds and renovations. Um, we do have the ones uh, ordered and should be delivered shortly for Northeast Park. So, um, but we did not look at a, a get around to doing a holistic plan on that yet. Um, I, I just it's a disappointment to me because it was something that I brought up when I first came on the board when we're still active with the bike task force. And sure. I thought that it was. I mean, it's not that big of a deal to take an inventory of you know you go around the park and say is there bike parking there or isn't there bike parking there. Isn't what are we going to do about it? Sure. We don't need that much either. No, no, right. I'll make sure we get it at that final list and do complete it. Yes, Cindy. Solar. <laughs> yes, solar. You know, so. Um, Solar, we did look at. We were budgeting for it, and we had some discussions with um, Tim uh, Milberg and what current opportunities they had. I also was looking at this with um, someone from uh, Train or Ingersoll Rand that does different different funding mechanisms and opportunities for that. Um, with my conversations with uh, gentleman Aaron Rafferty from from Train. He identified that the funding available for the solar for our group had all but basically dried up already. And so I reached out to Tim to have that discussion. He did a little research and agreed that it had and that now was not the time for us to try to go forward with solar, but rather to look at that in a couple of years unless there's some new um, incentives lined up. But basically what happened was the solar thing was so popular that the money they expected to last three years didn't last three years. And so it really got soaked up pretty quickly. So that's solar, it's a couple of years out. I think we do have- to About that five years ago. Yeah. I, 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 your great grandma when yeah. that happens. <laughs> oh God. Frustrating. Have you been contacted or had any discussions? I just got a thing in the mail yesterday that I described our solar plan and and there's some discussion of what the solar plan is going to be and what the fees are going to sure. be. Sure. And I have you made any discussions with them about that? You know, uh, we've looked at and talked about a little bit of community solar. In fact, um, we do have. Um, something that was offered through the um, Metropolitan Mayor's Caucus uh, this past year that um, we did provide them some information and we will be switching over some of our accounts to um, through a, a program similar to that so that it really doesn't show us much in the way of savings on an annual basis, but it just provides that we're going to be getting our electricity a little more sustainably in those areas. So um, that's something that Sandra and I have been working on and um, are, are looking to complete. So I am familiar with that, yes. Locations? It was one for it was designed for smaller facilities, so it was like for some of our. It wasn't for like the Oakton. Right? It was for like a couple of buildings, I think, on this property and another one or two elsewhere. So, not a lot, but it was a start somewhere. So, yes. Area in the area in the Ventura area in the Centennial Pool. Is 
guys that decide to lock on it? So our, one of our limiting factors for the capacity at Centennial Pool yeah. is the fixture count in the locker room. So the number of um, toilets and showers that we have. If we were able to increase it, and I say if because I'm not sure that we have the space to do that with ADA, we might have to like gut some of the interior walls. But I'm just saying if we did, I believe the most that we could get out of that with the existing footprint that we have is another 24. Does that sound right? So I think it was like we could add maybe another 24 if we looked into adding in a few extra fixtures in the restrooms. Um, but it has been quite a few years. That's just what I'm recalling. I think if we really wanted to get additional capacity for um, users in there, we would have to push the fence out and increase the deck space because I don't believe they count the grass areas. in Because there's kind of this formula of how much deck space do you have? There's a square footage number, um, how much water, and then there's something that divides out by the number of um, plumbing fixtures in your locker room. But I could find out more about that. If, if you could, whether the whole boys are interested or not, it's just something that isn't going away in the summer. And it's boring to most of us, but now it is. And I would like to understand what other options are being explored. Because it's clearly at certain Going once, going twice. Well, um, I thank you and uh, thank you also both to uh, Jennifer and Christy for coming tonight to help answer any additional questions that they were. Um, I am going to now turn it back over to Sandra to wrap up the capital presentation. Derek Abitation. I didn't know you had a list, Gary. So. Just real quick, high school football and the IHSA, and I believe it became some type of a state law is requiring AEDs at all of the events and practices, and I think that's going to trickle down pretty soon, so start to be ready for that. I don't know where we have AEDs in the inventory and if they're on the walls at different parks, but... Be assessing it right. to see it. Correct. Um, a lot of our parents are now looking for sunshade on the bench areas and the bleacher, even the bleachers, because everybody's concerned about that and the heat and whatever. If your IT people haven't looked at it, make sure you're ready for ransomware. Uh, we got hit where I work and people are getting hit every day and it's under the radar, but, uh, so, hmm? okay, some, some areas are not paying the ransom, and I don't know if your insurance even has it. Ours did, luckily, and we paid the ransom and got back up online in a week. But think about being down, okay, but most people are paying the ransom. It's so if your backups aren't where you need to be, you know, registration and whatever. And that's, oh, one other thing, and it was years ago, and I don't even know if it's legal now, but back in the day, we requested residents donate smaller trees to us that were on their property that they no longer wanted, and they took a tax deduction, and we rented a piece of equipment for a couple days, and it scooped them out and scooped them in. So I don't even know if, if you can take a tree off your property anymore. <laughs> but it's less than 10 inches. Yeah, and that's what they were. And they were, and they were, a tax deduction for that tree, which was a, a sizable one for a homeowner. And that's three trees for us. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Um, and I don't think I have the floor right now, but perhaps that we can ask if there's any other public comment on this presentation of your yeah. section at this point. for one moment, please. Um, we asked um, staff to look into that AED situation. Um, I know we've had a conversation about it at the table. Um, and one of the
one of the things that um, I'd like to explore more is those facilities being accessible to youth that live in the facility that are not accessible to adults or children and others are practicing outside the facility and that might be something that we could um, vulnerability accessibility cases of emergency um, I think all of us I would love to understand Pajerma's um, position and then perhaps at some other district I'm doing and if this is um, you know kind of a new way than what um, high school sports are doing um, I think we'd be remiss as a board if there was a need for an AED or something that was going on in one of our parks and folks didn't have access to it so I would like to see that Thank you. Thank, thanks for all your comments. Thank you, Terry, and everybody who's worked so hard on getting the proposed budget out. Um, so Terry did a great job of outlining all of the um, needs and opportunities uh, where we um, see capital um, for the 2020 budget. Um, and I'm sure as some of the discussion has already brought out is how the heck are we gonna pay for this? So um, as we've talked about before, and I did uh, provide a handout to you, um, we do work from um, this capital asset replacement plan where we're projecting forward um, what these expenses will look like. Um, so I've uh, provided you with a, a five year uh, projection based on that plan, um, the detail, and then a summary. The summary sheet um, shows our revenue sources and the uh, total estimated capital expenditures in each of those years. So I just wanted to kind of highlight um, where these revenues are, what the assumptions are. Um, we are including um, an annual uh, estimate of 350,000 to 400,000 of transfer from operating funds. Um, we've estimated these grant revenues where Terry's talked about um, these potential Oslag grants uh, or maybe a park grant uh, related to the um, do we have park grant? Well, I'm sorry, <laughs> yeah, for Oakton. Um, we've included revenue assumptions for grants. Um, if we are not successful in obtaining those grants, uh, we, would we would scale back those projects. Um, we've included the city TIF commitment like we talked about earlier in the years 2021 and 2023. Um, the historical society agreement that uh, was updated at the last board meeting, we've included those revenues in years 2021 through 2026. Um, the soccer field uh, estimate um, and other affiliate, potential affiliate contributions um, for the Hinkley Park Lighting projects. And we've also assumed that we're utilizing the um, non-referendum bonding capacity uh, that we also talked about at our last board meeting when um, PMA gave the presentation on our capacity and when we could borrow going in the future. Yeah. What was the plug you used for the Hinkley Park one? The, um, it's 100,000. 100,000? Mm -hmm. um, potential. Okay. <laughs> I just want to know what the net number is. Yes. So here you see what these projections look like going forward and what the projected remaining fund balance is based on these assumptions. Um, so we feel that um, to approximately 500,000 fund balance gives us sufficient flexibility should um, some things that we're not expecting arise. Um, but we have to continually, uh, you know, look at these revenue sources and look at our um, our operating performance and what we are able to transfer annually. And this this document is always being revised, as we've talked about many times. Um, but the so I'm showing here what uh, our estimated year end 2019 looks like. Um, the 
budget for 2020 and then projecting on forward. The other um, thing I wanted to highlight here is that these um, projections do include in 2023 approximately 3.5 million um, for the Oakton Ice Arena mechanical system, the replacement of the flooring around the rink area, bleachers, uh, safety netting, and uh, toward the parking lot. And oops, I'm not gonna get my highlighter going here. I just the um, the last line is the uh, estimated non-referendum debt service. So you can see that we've moved um, in the 2019 budget. We had estimated uh, 700,000 in proceeds uh, if it were issued um, in December of this year. Uh, what we talked about at the last board meeting was doing that bond issue um, in January, February um, for two years. So that now shows in 2020 uh, as 1.5 million. So lastly, I just wanted to kind of go over this um, assumption. The first assumption I talked about is the annual transfer from op operating funds. Um, this chart shows historically uh, what's been available um, from operating funds for capital investment. Uh, if we look at our revenues versus our expenditures, uh, the blue bars are showing our revenues. Um, in the, each of the last five years that we have actuals, um, what we're estimating for 2019 and what the 20, 2020 proposed budget uh, entails. So the blue bars are show our revenue, the uh, red bars show our expenses. So as long as our blue bars are bigger than our red bars, we, we should have uh, available, uh, funds available to reinvest in capital. Oopsie doopsie. Is this thing not working? No, okay, sorry. Um, so, the green line shows uh, the difference between the red, the blue bars and the red bars. Um, and you can see that uh, our, estimate, our estimate for uh, 2019 is currently about 340,000. We had budgeted uh, 250,000. So that reflects um, how we've been seeing our uh, operations look positive. And the 2020 proposed budget is estimating um, that we would be able to transfer 350,000. So. Why so rosy on the revenue section? Um, so the, this is typical of how we budget um, for our programming in order to maximize uh, the participation um, so with the, we also have the expenses commensurate with that, um, but when the revenues are not that high, the expenses will be lower as well. That's, that's correct. Yes, that's, it allows um, rec staff to maximize the programming um, for the, for participants um, because we can only expend what is allowed under the budget. So if things are going great, we wanna be able to offer that to more participants. Two thousand nineteen estimate is realistic to what we're projecting at this point. Yes. What, so, what? <laughs> estimated. Yeah. April. It is right. <laughs> <laughs> so, does anyone have any other questions about the um, 
with projections. I, I just feel it's really important that we don't just look at uh, 2020, that we think about how can we continue to invest in our capital assets over the long term. No one has any questions. I want to say thank you. Well, I wanted to say thank you to you, Terry, and your board, all the Christine, Jennifer, and all the staff members who worked together so hard. Um, I really, especially as the new commissioner, appre really appreciated the level of detail. Is there, a is there a certain time you'd like them by on the board? Uh, I think about that. We, we understand and expect, you know, you, you t all to have more comments because you're seeing this for the first time. So I would say, you know, we'd like, you know, by the first medium, I have to think about that when. But um, I think if you, Sandra, do you have a when would you when do we want the comments on ca comments? capital yeah um well uh it would be great if you could get them to us before the next board meeting so that we mm -hmm. can come respond. back um but i think what we'll have to do you know is take the comments but It'll have to then be if there's certain projects, because obviously this is one of the bigger things of, of the budget the board is making decisions on. If there's certain projects that people are not for, then we'll have to bring it back to the board and get a consensus, right, of whether it's going in the budget or not. So I think that would be helpful if you could tell us, I don't agree with, you know, I, I would like to see a discussion on this being removed or I would like to see this added, right? And we have the notes from tonight, um, but anything further from that? For instance, like the, the driving range lights, we'll put that on the thing. All right, we need to make a decision on that, right? So we're gonna come back and say, this is what we heard from you. Is there anything else? So the more you can get us on, you know, I don't agree with this, or I wanna cut this, um, the earlier the better, I guess, you know, within the next couple of weeks. Yeah, because if we want to have a, a discussion at the meeting, it would be good if we mm -hmm. have the information, you know, before we come. So we can respond with our, with our next uh, operating operating uh, presentation. But in any event, before we're asking the board to give us direction for the budget appropriation ordinance, we're all going to have to. The board will have to uh, be in agreement. So on November 7th, we'll go through those would be the plan, you know. So at the very latest, you know, the 1st of November, I would say, mm -hmm. the very latest. So we have time to prepare any kind of responses for that November 7th discussion on, okay, here, here's what's outstanding, you know. And, and for the new board members, what we usually do as well is go through the big topics like the capital the salaries and, you know, try to come to a consensus. Are you good with the percent, right, um, for the salaries? Are you okay with the capital? And then we go to these items that, you know, and that the board has brought up that you're fully against that you bring out or, you know, that we hear throughout um, and discuss. Does that make sense? Yeah. And you can just funnel that through me if you want. And I'll get it to the staff. <clears throat> All right. If there's no further questions, here's the record. Commissioner Leach. All right. So under uh, building and grounds, uh, I, 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 do you want to speak to it, uh, Superintendent Wolf, or do you want me to just read the motion? Read the motion, and then I can speak to it. Uh, okay. Perfect. Uh, approval of a change order, Centennial Activity Center roof replacement bid. <coughs> in relation to the Centennial Activity Center roof replacement bid, I move in accordance with Section 33E9 of the Illinois Public Contracts Act 
that the president determined in writing that the change order, number one, with Riddiford Roofing Company in the amount not to exceed 25933 is in the best interest of the Park District and is authorized by law, and that such written determination be provided by the president to the executive director, who shall then execute and deliver the change order. Second. <coughs> With a second, um, I'll open up for discussion. Thank you. Um, I do have a, um, a memo um, that was provided in front of you this night, this <coughs> evening. Um, this uh, change order is related to the Centennial Activity um, roof renovation. Um, as the memo lays out, um, there was some um, basically an error on the part of our engineer in the planning for temporary utilities. Um, a lot of the electric and the gas lines and things that serve the needs of the building are on the roof and they need to relocate some of those things as part of the project. Um, because this error was identified that um, they did not provide this direction in the <coughs> bid package, um, we have negotiated with them that they're going to cover 50% of the cost because we didn't have the opportunity to competitively bid this. Um, had we had this been identified as it should have been and put into the bid package, we would have had a cost to incur with the project. And so we feel that that 50% offset um, is, a, is a fair value for this. And so um, <clears throat> the, what the issue had come down was that they were claiming they thought the building was going to be closed for the duration of the project, which is kind of crazy, really. But <laughs> um, but in either either case, um, Jennifer's worked hardly, uh, hard on trying to get this uh, squared away over the last few days so we can get this project um, back in play again. It was supposed to start um, last week on Monday, so we're a little behind schedule right now. Um, she was actually able to get everything scheduled and um, coordinated with um, Jenny Myers, the facility manager, and the project's going to be getting started um, tomorrow morning so that we can get a few things done before uh, an event they have on next Tuesday. So um, we're going to be working hard and heavy on this um, starting tomorrow. So, Any questions or comments? Seeing none, could you uh, roll call vote, please? Mr. Coyne? Mr. Grau? Yes. Mr. LaDuke? Yes. Mr. Leach? Yes. Mr. O'Donnell? Yes. Mr. Tunnell? Yes. Mr. Harrington? Yes. Uh, back to you, uh, Ms. Harrington. All right. Any new business to come before the board? Seeing none, um, I move to adjourn to closed session for the purposes to discuss land acquisition for TC5. We'll reconvene to the regular board meeting to adjourn the meeting. Second. Okay, second. So any discussion? I have a no. quick discussion, slightly unrelated, but it's I'm gonna use it here. If we get into a situation where we're gonna discuss policy before the end of the year, how do we is that is that a new business item where we'd add something to the motion to be discussed and get consensus? What how is that matched? Like through a new business motion? Well, you could bring it up for discussion in the future. So that's Correct. Why I want to Correct. Do that. Exactly. Yeah. I'm just trying to figure it's out. Probably. It's just a new business thing, and then it will be yeah, added to the agenda. Yeah, the agenda. Yeah. Perfect. That's what I was trying to get. It just policy confuses me. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. No, no worries. You want to go back to new business now? No. Okay. All right. Um, so, uh, seeing that uh, uh, we've seconded, we have no discussion, any comments or questions? Mr. Grau? Yes. Mr. LaDuke? Yes. Mr. Leach? No. Mr. O'Donnell? Yes. Mr. Tunnell? Yes. Mr. Coyne? Commissioner Harrington? Yes. All right, we are now adjourned to a closed session. Tuesday, October 3rd, 2019, and it is 10.07 p.m. p.m. I now move to adjourn the meeting of the Forest Preserve Board.
part, the whole park part of commissioners, <laughs> the park board, people in the park board know. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Hearing none, we are adjourned.